In a world overrun by neocon warmongers, and with the mass media in the pockets of the cabal elite, there remains one bastion of truth amidst the confusion. One beacon of light shining through the murky fog of spin and Islamophobic propaganda. That's right. It's the MP Radio Security Council. The final frontier in the fight for freedom and fairness. I give you the Security Council. أبداً لا لن نحيد أبداً لا لن نحيد أبداً لا لن نحيد عن فط الإيمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القرآن أبداً لا لن نحيد أبداً لا لن نحيد أبداً لا لن نحيد عن فط الإيمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القرآن سائر في طريق الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم Rahmatullah Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. This is your brother Ahmed. You are tuned in to Middle Path Radio, and this is the Security Council, joined by my co host, Brother Khabbab. And uh, a quick greeting from Brother Khabbab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome all of our listeners um, to today's show. Inshallah, today's show is uh, uh, we've got a few guest um, phone ins as well today, as, and a lot of very interesting uh, topics up for discussion today. That's correct. So, I mean, um, uh, as Brother Khabbab just explained, we've got a couple of uh, guest appearances on today's show. Um, uh, we'll be having uh, two calls live from uh, Brother Abdul, uh, sorry, Brother Majid Freeman, not Abdul Majid, Brother Majid Freeman, who is himself a aid worker, and most recently he's been um, doing some aid convoy work. Um, taking materials, uh, much needed supplies, food, medicine, that kind of thing to, uh, to, to Syria. But more importantly, he was also on this very same convoy that Alan Henning, uh, the prisoner in the hands of ISIS, uh, um, you know, that, that um, aid worker, Alan Henning, they were on the same convoy together. So we're going to have him uh, calling us very soon and um, uh, sharing his views and his thoughts and just generally his experience and what, what he thinks about what's happening with with uh, with Alan Henning. You want to tell us who the other guest is? Also, the other guest is uh, Brother Dili Hussein, uh, Dilwar Hussein as well. Um, he's a journalist um, uh, who's also an editor as well um, with Five Pillars and he's a blogger as well on Huffington Post. So I'm sure most of our listeners are also aware of who he is and he'll be obviously joining us, giving us his insight into to, um, the take on the current uh, U.S. strikes in Syria. That's right. So um, uh, those are some of the uh, big issues, as you're already aware. Um, some of the things that we've publicized that we're going to talk about, I'm going to read them to you. As you also know, Brother Habab just mentioned, you know, some breaking news has happened since I think this morning or was it yesterday night um, uh, with regards to the um, uh, bombing of Syria by the United States and her so-called allies. So the you know the issues that we're going to talk about is will the UK number one will the UK do anything to release uh, Allen? Number two, um, we're going to discuss the Obama ban on fighters or his proposed plan to the United Nations to ban fighters from traveling from parts of uh, you know uh, U- um, Europe and the Western world to join um, you know uh, revolutions like the one in Syria, for example. Uh, we're also going to discuss um, English extremism. And what drives uh, the far right and the and this kind of English extremism? Uh, we're also going to just probably bring there are some overlapping issues. We're going to talk about um, uh, the problem of paedophilia in the EDL uh, English Defence League, and we're lastly going to talk about um, uh, some cases to do with Islamophobia, such as the Rotherham Masjid that was attacked and vandalised by some uh, haters, uh, some Islamophobes. So those are some of the uh, things. There are a few others. I haven't really mentioned all of them uh, because it just won't be, um, uh, you know, they will probably come under some of the titles that we've just already uh, covered. Yeah, as you've come to kind of know with our, with our show, really, um, there's a lot <laughs> of discussions that kind of pop up along That's the right. way and there's a lot of overlapping discussions. Um, so, as I said, I think we've got some very big or kind of meaty discussions ahead of us. Um, yeah, so definitely, definitely. So I urge everybody show. who's listening uh, tonight, um, to call us uh, or to send us text message or a WhatsApp message uh, on our you know our hotline it's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight that's oh seven four double seven zero eight zero 
248. If there are any international um, listeners, because we do know that some of them have logged in, then do remember to add plus 44, okay, to this mobile number. So it would appear like this now when you put it in your phone. It's plus 44, 7477, So you drop the zero on the front. So it will be plus 44, 7477. 080248 and if you prefer to email us it's info at middlepathradio.com that's normally how we um, get people to contact us if they've got queries comments you know feedback that kind of thing um, if they're having some trouble uh, any trouble with playing the app obviously most of you will be into this show via smartphone be it an iPhone or an Android device so um, uh, be sure to tell your friends and colleagues family to download also that get her as well this is at middle path radio That's and great. obviously uh, a couple of weeks ago our jungle week um, mm-hmm. the nominees are currently up on our twitter so please do uh, go into twitter select who you think should be the jungle of the week um and uh, just hashtag jungle of the week you know it's as simple as that that's right um and obviously they're all from so we've got a short headlines. list of who the jungle so we do have the week. short list but I will tell you to go on to Twitter and actually see who the shortlist are and they actually are from that's our, right. uh, from, from the current uh, news headlines we'll be discussing today. Brilliant. And um, those of you who are not aware, if you miss tonight's show or you catch like only the first half or something like that and you want to you know, catch up on the rest of it tomorrow morning or, or another day, um, go subscribe to our YouTube channel, okay, Middle Path Radio YouTube channel. Um, you should be able to just Google that or, or YouTube it. Um, you'll be able to find a channel, just subscribe and you'll get access to all our um, uh, you know, uh, live shows that are uploaded as soon as they're done, inshallah. So that's really a very, um, uh, you know, quick lineup of what we've got happening today. Um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, we can, I'm going to just lay down uh, the backdrop to tonight's uh, call-ins, especially because we've got two very special guests uh, coming in. And yes, we are going to talk about the uh, breaking news, which is uh, the US and their allies they strike targets in Syria. I'm just going to quickly read um, a few uh, lines from an Al Jazeera um, article here. And you will know, those of you who listen to the Security Council will know that we refer to all different outlets um, of journalism, different media stations and channels. This one is titled, US and Allies Strike ISIS Targets in Syria. All right. Uh, US and Arab Coalition... Notice here, U.S. and Arab coalition attacks ISIS in northern Syria as Washington conducts separate strikes on the Al-Nusra front. So U.S. forces who bombed ISIS and uh, fighters in Syria also targeted a separate armed group group plotting an imminent attack against U.S. and Western forces, the U.S. Defense Ministry has said. So Arab allies, Bahrain, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia... Qatar and the United Arab Emirates took part in the strikes, which started early on Tuesday, it added. So eight U.S. strikes were aimed at the Khorasan Group, Khorasan Group, which is made up of experienced Al-Qaeda operatives, the Pentagon said in a statement. Again, just want to remind our listeners that we're reading from an article from Al Jazeera. Um, Again, um, we're going on their word for whatever they've written here. They quote here, the United States has also taken action to disrupt the imminent attack plotting against the United States and the Western interests, conducted by a network of seasoned Al-Qaeda veterans, sometimes referred referred to as the Khorasan Group, who have established a safe haven in Syria to develop external attacks, construct and test improvised explosive devices, and recruit Westerners to conduct operations, the statement said. So the U.S. military used fighter jets as well as remotely piloted aircrafts and Tomahawk missiles to conduct 14 strikes against ISIS. Okay, so I mean the rest of it just goes on to detail how they killed so many ISIS fighters and they're also targeting Nusra fighters and um, and, and Al Jazeera just reporting how many um, what kind of damages the, these groups have uh, you know uh, incurred since these uh, airstrikes. All right, so obviously that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing that is mentioned in this article is that there are a number of uh, so-called partners. The U.S. military says its partners in airstrikes included Jordan, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. OK, and, and the key thing is that they either had taken part in or supported the airstrike show. Actually, it's very much an active 
um, uh, ally. Well, let's listen to some of the spin and some of the rhetoric uh, that, that's been quoted here uh, from these so-called politicians. The minister said, Jordan participated to strike, open quote, terrorism in its home in order to protect Jordan's security and stability and to prevent terrorism from reaching the United Kingdom. Excuse me, my correction there, from reaching the Kingdom of Jordan, end quote. The attacks came just two weeks after the U.S. formed a coalition to confront the ISIS group, which has taken over large areas of Syria and Iraq and declared a caliphate. So some of the ways that these different groups are actually, um, uh, so these countries are allied to the U.S. in this effort with the airstrikes is sometimes um, providing, um, you know, uh, air bases, providing intelligence, um, uh, you know, locations, GPS coordinates, that kind of stuff. Um, when I say bases, they, you know, the American aircrafts, they actually land there, they refuel there, they, you know, uh, a lot of the um, drones, some of the drone sites where they actually remotely, um, uh, you know, fly the aircrafts, they're actually based in some of these Middle Eastern um, countries. So it's just, uh, you know, a shame that this is what's happening. Um, you know, we saw Israel um, uh, kill roughly 2,000 um, civilians. These Arab states sat by and you know, watched twiddling their thumbs. Uh, there didn't seem to be any kind of coalition against um, uh, terrorism then. Uh, similarly, we've been watching, they've been watching for the last three years the killing of roughly 190 something thousand. Uh, it's well over 200,000, obviously. It's over 200,000 now, right? Um, and those are just the UN, UN figures. Um, uh, in, 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 in Syria, uh, killed by the uh, Bashar al-Assad forces, referred very euphemistically as the regime, uh, killing uh, these uh, these civilians, children. These Again, these Arab states, they, they stood by, they didn't do anything, perhaps, um, uh, and, and they realized that the threat to Assad are these rebel groups, removing this kind of dictatorship, which is quite common in some of these Arab countries that are actually now really supporting uh, these airstrikes. Uh, against the re rebels, they have a common interest. They want to, you know, secure and protect their, um, uh, you know, their what's the word I'm looking for? Their permanence, and you know, want to um, sustain the current status quo in the Arab world, which is, you know, these dictatorships perpetuating themselves, staying in power forever without any kind of, you know, room for dissent and choice for the people to have them uh, replaced. I think just uh, another interesting fact that would be good to kind of mention, uh, which was um, I read that President Obama, the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. um, this, uh, after his bombing of Syria, it's actually his seventh Muslim country that he has bombed. Wow. So um, there goes so much for peace and the peace <laughs> prize and so much for the, all those who came about and said, you know, Obama's the new face, it's going to change and all of these kind of things. He's actually far worse than George W. Bush. He only bombed two countries. And you thought you could never get worse than that. It just did, basically. So, so um, and, and uh, if you thought George W. Bush was, uh, was kind of uh, stupid or, uh, you know, dim-witted for having believed in his own... A rhetoric. Um, actually, you know, the Americans didn't even say anything about wa weapons of mass destruction. The American people were kind of more gullible than the Brits. The Brits needed some convincing that there was a good basis for going to war in Iraq. And uh, Tony Blair, who also won the, what is it, the philanthropist yes, award. Yes, the GQ philanthropy, philanthropist. <laughs> I can't award. even say the word now. Um, uh, award. And yeah. he actually got our so award he, he, of Django of the Week as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, he won uh, Django of the Week last, uh, last L L L uh, Security Council. No, last, the one before. The one actually, before, excuse uh, me. So, I mean, he presented this case and we saw, we saw what happened there. The whole region was destabilized. The entire country... You know, brought to its knees, um, no security. Um, uh, you know, in, in the in the region, and there was a, this whole civil war kind of thing happening. Um, so this happened as a result, as a direct result of the American UK uh, invasion of uh, Iraq, and therefore these rebel groups were born. Um, the the resistance was formed, made up of a variety of different different um, groups. By the way, you know, ISIS is just typically a, um, a blanket paintbrush to, you know, paint everybody with the same colour. I think those really. who have been following our kind of last few shows uh, can kind of see that uh, a lot of the discussion around Syria is the same things kind of being mentioned again and again and we've seen it. Some of the stuff we've said yeah, is we've actually said happening now. Exactly, it's exactly. So the things that we've said foretold, you could say, are things mm. that are happening. And it's quite simple. It's not really uh, where we're mystical we know into the future. It's very evident and very yeah. clear to see the strategy in place by the West 
Western powers uh, that be, you know, That's yeah, right. against, against Syria. You clearly don't need to be a genius uh, to be able to see what's happening here. I think any, any kind of uh, common sense will probably um, uh, see the same kind that we're seeing. And we said that this is what would happen. It will start in Iraq with the strikes, okay? And it would be all about ISIS, right? Uh, how they're just this monster group. The and then it, it will, uh, Yeah, the bogeyman. Um, as it were, and then it will spread. This plan will spread, and it will go to Syria. And it will not just be about ISIS; it will be about a variety of uh, different um, uh, groups, and all, all the, rebel And groups. within the first day, they've already shown it that they've actually gone and bombed a group that was not ISIS. Yeah. So the pretext of them going into to Syria to do those attacks were to attack ISIS because they're the threat. Yeah. But therefore, they've actually spread that now. Said, oh, to this Khorasan group, and then next thing you know, it will spread to another group, and then. So this uh, is unprecedented because um, uh, not only was it a disastrous mistake um, uh, with uh, uh, you know going in 2006, what they did in uh, in Iraq. Uh, and them admitting now, or admitting now, um, you know, in, in, in uh, what's the word, in uh, cloaked words that yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. We thought we did the right thing, but it was a disastrous mistake, and we shouldn't have been. Our boy shouldn't have died. And a lot of British lives were lost, and a lot of Muslim lives were lost. A lot of Iraqi civilians died as a result. Their entire country um, uh, crippled as a result of multiple um, American um, uh, campaigns, military violent campaigns. Uh, in, in, in this foreign faraway country all right and to, to to know that after all of that after acknowledging and even the the public clearly saying that this is you know this is Afghanistan we need to pull out of Iraq it's just it's just a huge mess it's causing us a lot of you know uh, is there it's not our business plus we went on a on a pack of um uh, it was wrong for us to go then only what was what it a few days later already in there again with you know aircrafts and so on, sending you know special teams uh, to go and talk um, uh, and train some of the um, uh, Shia militias out there, some of the Kurdish militias out there, some of the Iranian-backed um, uh, militant groups and extreme groups out there. So I know we have perhaps. Is, do you want to check with uh, Mr. Producer? Sorry, um, uh, we all good. Is our guest on on online? He's he's ready to go. Um, uh, um, I take it, it's brother brother Majid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum How are you doing, bro? Alhamdulillah, I'm very well. Thank you very much, uh, brother Majid. I want to thank you for actually, um, uh, you know, taking the time out at this late hour to uh, get, share us a few of your words. Um, just be um, uh, the questions. Just want to let our listeners know again uh, that brother Majid, brother Majid Freed, Freeman, is actually uh, an aid worker, and he's been very re- Syria. And the reason why we've had we've got him on our show uh, today is because he was actually on the aid giving mission. Um, uh, that Alan Henning was part of, uh, the man who's currently a prisoner of ISIS. Uh, so we just wanted to speak directly with somebody who know, knows that man and who's had some time and experience with him, uh, especially on the road, traveling there, what motivated him and so on and so forth. But before we get into that, Brother Majid, is there, I know you're involved in a lot of, um, you know, you know, may I accept you know a lot of uh, charitable uh, projects and so on and so forth. You do a lot of um, aid work and charity work. Is there like a central place that maybe our listeners can go to to um, find out a little bit more about not just yourself, but the kind of work that you do? Maybe if they're interested in in getting involved and helping out. Um, I've, I've got a new Facebook page here, which is um, Facebook dot com forward slash Magic Freeman six five zero. Okay. Okay, inshallah. Yeah, and the charity which I work with, um, which I'm a volunteer for, is called One Nation. Mashallah. And you can find them as well on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash One Nation UK or www.onenationuk.org. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so those are the kind of places that you can go to to find out more about the work and the charity um, projects that Brother Majid is involved with, inshallah, if you want to get involved, go hit up those um, links, inshallah. So, um, Brother Majid, um, tell us a little bit about um, what kind of work you did in Syria. Why were you motivated? What What's the real story behind Syria, as opposed to what we're hearing a lot about in the headlines? Um, well, if I take it back to uh, 2012, 2012, I went to Gaza for the first time in my life, and we did, we had a workshop. We done a little workshop there for for a few weeks with the children. Mm-hmm. So um, Alhamdulillah, that was my first ever experience um, going to like a war zone or going to um, one of them 
groups of countries where they're actually really deprived of everything. Right. And SubhanAllah, it really touched me. So we went back to Gaza again in 2013. So when we were fundraising for Gaza in 2013, um, we were going door to door collection. One auntie, um, mm. she mentioned to us that why aren't we doing anything for Syria? Because um, the, the, there's a lot of um, suffering happening in Syria. So we said, Inshallah, um, Inshallah, we'll do something as well. Uh, once we. I didn't really know how we would go in contact at that time. We got back from what happened to be that I received a call from someone asking if I wanted to go go, go to Syria as an opportunity. So, alhamdulillah, it's like the opportunity just fell in front of us. So we started fundraising for Syria and we went to Syria for the first time in May 2013. So, so on that convoy, uh, Alan, Alan Henning, who is Gadget, uh, came on that convoy too. That was his first convoy to Syria too. So I got to know Alan on that convoy. Right. And um, we got to know each other pretty really. He's a really good guy, mashallah. Um, big hearted, generous man. And right. he'll always try help out in whatever way he can. And sure. um, met a lot of other beautiful brothers, mashallah, on that journey. Mashallah. And once we actually got into Syria, um, and I seen like, until then, I thought Gaza was really bad with the situation. But um, what I realized was when I when I visited Gaza, it's like in Gaza the bombing's finished, mm. and now people are trying to get back on their feet again. Sure. Yeah, so they're at that stage. When you're in Syria, the bombing's still happening. So, so Syria is way way worse than what what the situation in Gaza was. Even the recent bombings that happened in Gaza. Um, happened for a month, but um, it's like Syria has been going on for um, over three years now. We're not trying to put the uh, oppression uh, and the bombings in Gaza down or anything in any way. We're just trying sure. to compare them to so that people can understand the actual level of suffering on the ground in Syria. It's actually, um, it's absolutely unimaginable that after three years, this is still going on. And this is the uh, uh, Assad uh, government, Assad yeah, forces Assad that are, regime, the, you know, committing bombing, these... Yeah, the, the daily bombings and um, the, to carry on. Uh, we, once we reached Syria, we actually went inside and we were absolutely um, like like at the refugee camps. Once we get inside mm -hmm. um, at the Turkey, we go in via Turkey. At the Turkish borders, you get refugee camps. We are looked after to some extent by charities. Uh, to go one hour further inside, you will find people who have not had food for so long because no one really working inside Syria. The UN themselves have admitted that there's hundreds of thousands of people who they can't reach, uh, who they can't reach out to. So Sorry. that's why, that's why I found when we went further inside that um, these people rely on aid. Convoy. I'm sorry to interrupt you, brother Majid. Yeah. Um, what, what, is, what is this word convoy, and um, what are you guys taking? There is a we we'll, we'll fundraise some money locally down here, mm -hmm. and five six thousand pounds will buy an ambulance. A lot of people are curious about how how do you go around buying an ambulance? Ambulance from eBay or auctions, X and HS ambulances. So, yeah, so they're good ambulances, alhamdulillah. Ambulances with the, the, the people's donations, or sometimes a few businessmen get together and they contribute towards not, not only businessmen, even um, alhamdulillah, uh, the generous people. They just Inshallah. get together and they contribute towards ambulance. And um, what we do, what we then do is we load it up with medical aid or food, or whatever we think is most needy at the time. We've taken a lot of sea locks from here before. Um, what sea locks? Are you familiar with what sea locks is? I am, but uh, and perhaps maybe many of our listeners may not be aware what sea locks okay. is. Okay, it's like a, it's like a powder mm. um, in which the US military use. So if someone was to get injured now, when it's someone's arm, for example, mm. so instead of just getting some um, cloth and just wrapping it around the person's arm to stop it from bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to do this, then and then take them to the hospital or take them to see a doctor. Um, sometimes you may not be able to get to see a doctor for maybe a few hours I because see. of the amount of bombings and because you may be stuck somewhere. So sure. what would happen in this situation is most likely the person would bleed to death. Bleed to what death. Locks, yeah, well, they would bleed to death. Right. But what Celox does is you meant to pour locks the powder into the wound and what it does is that it makes almost like a blood clot so it stops all the bleeding 
Okay. So then if you were to then go see a doctor after three hours, uh, you won't bleed to death. It's really so that's a really essential kind of hemostatic agent. That's mm. a technical uh, name yeah. one of our um, uh, co-hosts uh, is just adding there. So I mean, what we can see here from what you're describing is that's a really essential kind of aid material medical um, material that is required in these kinds of disaster zones in this kind of um, war-torn parts of the world where civilians are often you know could reach the hospital um, uh, if they had this kind of this kind of material to stop the internal bleed or you know the bleeding where, where, where a lot of people are dying on the way from just the bleeding really they could have been treated and they could have probably been saved right yes definitely so when we, we give these to the hospitals and what the hospitals will do is they'll load the ambulances or the doctors or whoever, the paramedics, they'll give these to all of them. So whoever's first at the scene or whoever's in that area, they could uh, try use the sea locks instantly to start saving lives, inshallah. MashaAllah. So we take sea locks. Um, we take sea locks. We also take uh, baby milk, um, tin food, clothes. Like uh, I remember on the winter convoy in December, we sent a container of uh, warm clothes because um, it gets extremely cold down there in Syria. And I think last time was the first time that, mm-hmm. it, that it actually snowed after a very, very long time. And mm-hmm. I was there at the time. And I remember even whilst we were on our way there on the convoy, um, when you're driving through all the different countries, the closer we got from Greece to Syria, right. when we were getting into Turkey, I remember seeing snow everywhere. We were, we were freezing. And... Yeah. This is um, keeping in mind that I had a few layers on. I had wow. my neck mask on. I had two socks on, thermal socks on. Um, I, had a, I was wearing a long sleeve top. And the, so I had all of this stuff and I was still freezing. Wow. And I remember when we went to, when we got inside Syria and we went to the refugee camp, I remember seeing a little girl with, a, with not even sandals just running around in the mud. Whilst mm-hmm. I was there, fully wrapped up with my boots, everything, with my gloves. And so I was looking at these people, and this is just normal life. This, um, they play with the mud, run around in the mud. That's like their games because um, they've got nothing else to do. So this, is, this in, you know, demonstrates again um, you know, the, the desperate need for aid work in these kinds of um, regions, especially where you've already said that known organizations like the United Nations and their charitable um, operations are not even able to reach some of those parts or it's too unsafe for them to actually go there. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about um, Alan Henning. What motivated him You know, uh, to, to go? What, what was this convoy? And then you know, we can go into the question of like, you know, what do you think should happen um, think, with this situation? I think what motivated Alan was seeing the suffering of the people down there. Mm. So I think this actually motivated him to get, to get up and see if he could do something to help them. Sure. He wasn't the kind of man who would just make a donation and leave it at that. He wanted to do more than that and to actually help stop the suffering. So he I went see. down there, out there in May for the first time, uh, May 2013. That's when he went out uh, to Syria for the first time. And when he seen the, the suffering with his own eyes, um, I think that, and he's seen that the whole world had abandoned these people and they, and that we're a lifeline for them and that the aid convoys from the UK, wherever charity it may be, that these charities and the, these aid convoys are actually a lifeline That's right. for these people. They rely on them. They wait for them. When he realized this, this uh, more definitely motivated him to work even harder when he came home. And um, I remember when we were on our way to, on the convoy in December, um, I was having a, just a general chat with, the, with, uh, with Gadget and he was telling me about we were just, um, like, everyone has their own reasons, why like, what motivated them to come on a convoy. They have their own story. So I was just chatting to him, and he was telling me about how he's seen in the news that um, some children, some babies, had passed away in Syria uh, in a hospital mm. after the electricity went off. And um, he, he, this, this touched him a lot. This touched him, this moved him. And... What he actually done, like a lot of us would see this stuff in the news all the time. Everyone sees the suffering in the news. And we just flick through the channels and we'd, uh, we'd feel upset and we'd flick through the channels and maybe flick onto football, carry on like, uh, we'd forget about it after a bit because we're so used to it. Sure. We're so used to seeing the suffering. 
So this, he, uh, Alan uh, was a genuine guy who was motivated yeah. by the same reasons that yeah. you brothers were motivated, you know, to go and help yeah, uh, the Syrian, you know, children, the Syrian Inshallah. men and women. Inshallah. Alan took it a step further though. When he seen this, mm. he started raising money and he bought a generator himself. Wow. And what he said was that next time this happens in a hospital, um, the generator will switch on, so the babies won't die, Inshallah, and... Um, they'll actually, even though he can't say he can't help everyone in Syria, at least he'll be able to save a few lives. So he actually sure. done something practical to uh, help these people and make a change. So that's what the kind of thing that generators would be very yeah. useful for. You mentioned that sometimes yeah. hospitals lose power, people die as a result yeah. of that kind of thing. The generators, yeah. you know, generate electricity and give power yeah. when the electricity cuts out. You want to add anything, brother Khabbab? Yeah. So it's just kind of trying to move the discussion on a bit more, which is. Uh, Obviously, Alan went there just just very briefly as to what happened from the moment he entered into Syria and what led to his um, uh, capture, and then just moving on very short quickly after that because um, we're quite a bit short on time. Um, which is, you know, what do you think is the solution? How can we go about? Um, how, what what was the solution to the uh, Alan? Um, yeah, what would be a good outcome? You know, what's the outcome that we would be looking for? And what do you think it would be the way or the best way forward for whether it be the UK government or whether that be um, from just general public what we can do in order to kind of uh, uh, work towards the release of Allah Henning? Brother Majid, carry on. So can you repeat that again please, bro? Yeah, so first it's just about, um, just, just briefly just talk about uh, what happened from the moment when Alan kind of entered into Syria and that led to his kind of uh, capture by um, ISIS. And then just your, your thoughts on what you think is a solution, how, we, how Alan can be released or freed, uh, what can be done. Okay, what happened was um, once we entered Syria, um, we, we all got into, we got into a coach and we had like a 30 minutes to drive into Syria. This was in December when Alan got taken. Um, so we had a 30 minutes drive into Syria and we went into an area called Adana, which we've been many times before to deliver aid. And we're very, very familiar with this area. We've never ever had any problems uh, before at all. So we went into a compound. We all got off the coach and we went into a compound of the building where the locals were hosting us. And they got tea for us and we were just, uh, just chilling out and letting it sink in. Um, um, letting it sink in. And then it sink in and um, after about five minutes, um, after around five minutes, some masked gunmen came running into the building, into the compound, sorry, and they asked us all to get into the, uh, get into the rooms. There were a few rooms there, so we, uh, we were like kind of panicking because we didn't really know what was being said but, um, because our guns were being waved about. We thought, let's just go with the floor and don't do anything wrong down here. Let's not mess up. Maybe there's some sort of a misunderstanding. And... Um, Let's, let's just get this over and done with. Mm. They put us into separate rooms. I was in the first room and uh, they made us put our phones and passports into the middle of the room and they interviewed, they, they called us out for interrogation one by one and check, they went through our phones, our passports, double checked everything, just making sure we're not spies. And soon as this finished, um, soon as this, this ordeal finished, we realized that uh, Alan, who was in one of the other rooms, had actually been taken. Mm. So um, initially we thought this must have been some sort of a misunderstanding or maybe some temporary detention. And as and soon as they realized that um, uh, Alan is a humanitarian aid worker, they'll, they'll release him. It's something simple and straightforward. This must have been some sort of a misunderstanding. That's what we thought initially. Yeah. Because uh, we know that Alan is a genuine aid worker. And there's no reason to take him. So you were kind of confident that he would probably be released, you know, sooner or later, because uh, yeah, they'll yeah, do their checks and they'll find out he's a genuine guy. Yeah, yeah. we thought they, they'll do the checks, and as soon as they do the checks, they'll release him. Sure. But um, that wasn't the case. They kept saying that we'll release him tomorrow or we'll release him soon. However, this just kept dragging on. And what happened then was uh, the following week, the fighting kicked off in the in that same town. Uh, so after the fighting kicked off, um, ISIS had uh, fled from the area. Sure. So then this actually made things even more difficult because we had communication issues. We didn't know. Where uh, they we didn't have a point of contact who to reach out to to ask about gadget. So, sure. Um, 
Okay, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna say. So now that you know, we know how he got captured. Uh, you know, these are like sensitive questions. Um, do you think he was captured, and were they? Pre- do you think they ever intended to hold him as a prisoner and then probably um, list him for execution the way that we're seeing now staged? Do you think this is what they intended to do from the beginning, or? I don't think so because they uh, they didn't um, initially they didn't. They didn't say that they were gonna keep him, or they didn't. They they kept saying that we'll release him soon, or we'll release him tomorrow, which implies that they found they didn't find him guilty of anything. Mm. So, and what do you think motivates them now? Longer. After what, how how long has it been? He's been in their captivity. What's motivating them now to take this decision to to have these only, prisoners executed? Like, they've had Alan for over nine months, nearly ten months now, and they, they've not they, uh, they've never ever released any videos or anything whatsoever in in that nine months. Mm. But um, it's only now that um, the rest want to get involved in bombing them. I think oh. they're using him as a cheer, as a part of it. Um, as a token to say that if you if you start bombing us, we'll we'll kill your people, we'll kill we'll kill this hostage. So even though um, it's not justifiable because Alan is an innocent aid worker, he's, he's he's got nothing to do with the politics. Right. However, um, they're just saying that if you bomb us, we we'll kill we we'll kill your people. Obviously, so, um, uh, so to to really bring this to a close, brother uh, Majid, what do we want to see happen with? Um, I mean, what what's the outcome that we would be desirable? What would, what are we looking forward to? In, in you know, as a as a result, as a positive result in all this. I think uh, I think look, in community, the imams, organizations like Cage, they've they all they've all been trying their best. They still are trying their best to help Alan get released. Mm. However, now it comes down to the government. It's been it's been ten days now, and they've not said a word. Just earlier today, they actually um, um, they said he's a selfless man, etc. However, they're not taking any steps to help release him. What kind of you thing do you think they, they can do, do to, to release really him, release him? What kind yeah, of thing? You know, if they do want to release him, they can release him because um, the Italians, the French, the Germans, the Spanish, they all managed to release their hostages too. Everyone has managed to get their hostages back home. I Just see. on the weekend, Turkey managed to release 49 hostages without wow. paying a single penny. Wow. So this isn't just about ransom. This isn't just about money. It's just that um, the ball is now in David Cameron's court. Yeah. Mm. We know the fact that they released a video and to show that we, we will kill we will kill Alan um, if you... If if you continue bombing us or whatever, it shows that they didn't just release a video of um, of themselves um, killing Alan. Mm. They showed that we will kill Alan if you do whatever, which gives us time to contact them and negotiate and to try help free Alan. Yeah, and just a little while ago, just an hour ago, actually. Um, this is breaking news that Alan's wife said that she received an audio, an audio file from um, from Alan, um, pleading for his life, asking asking for help. Which again goes to show this implies. Yeah, I think this is an indication from the, the those who are holding Alan that they are willing to free him. Yeah, see. they're not. If they wanted to, they could have killed him by now. So the but key thing because they're sending these messages, this goes against the usual pattern where they are after after a week they kill the person, but they're not doing that with Alan. They let him send an audio file, which goes to show that they are willing to um, uh, free Alan. It now comes down to whether our government are going to help him if they're going to abandon him. Okay, Jazakallah khair, right now, Brother Majid. Um, uh, yeah. You know, really, we've actually uh, run out of time completely now. Um, okay. I just want to say, you know, really big Jazakallah khair. Thank you to you for um, uh, coming, uh, you know, to, to give us your time and speak to us uh, on air via this uh, live call-in. Um, it gives every, all our listeners, you know, a, an, a, an insight into what aid work is and exactly what's happened with Alan, what kind of guy he is as well. And, um, uh, you know, just, you know, what kind of result that Muslims in the UK have been, you know, uh, campaigning for uh, and whose responsibility it is right now to have this man uh, released. Brother Majid, I want to say assalamu alaikum to you, inshallah. Hopefully we can have you back on our show very, very soon. Wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullah. And I'd like to say, Jazakallah, for having me. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum. 
Brother Khabbab, so you was going to add some few points, and I know we got to wrap up because we have another guest uh, about to come. A couple of point, quick points from you, and I think, then I think that one of the key points, uh, kind of trying to sum up what Brother Maji was talking about, is that uh, it, what seems to be the solution to this whole issue about Alan being um, held captive. It, it comes down to negotiating, or it comes down to come and, and actually having that contact and that discussion. And it looks like the ISIS are up for. Uh, a discussion, you know, they are, they are up for talking. Yes, the ball, like I said, the ball's in David Cameron's court. It's in the British government's court. It's Go out and basically court. and arrange it. And I actually didn't know that until Brother Maji mentioned that the Turkish didn't pay a penny for all of the hostages to be released. I actually thought maybe some ransom may have been paid. So therefore, actually, that opens up even further, which is. There's further scope. It's not just about money. It's not just about something. There, there are something. If you go and, in and, and Turkey, discuss, by the way, is no saint, of um, course, because I've just read an article today that Turkey welcomes the uh, U.S. airstrikes. Uh, yeah, so, welcomes so the airstrikes. in that sense, they don't know. They're not. They're not ally of um, ISIS. Of that's, ISIS. That's, yeah. you know, that's, but that's they still managed to get there. But they still managed to get forty nine. So you know, um, and like I said, other Western nations, barring the U.S. and the U.K. Um, so France, Italy, Germany, and so forth. You know, they've managed to get their hostages released. So, I think the answer is very clear. The glaringly obvious, uh, you know, solution really is stop bomb- dropping bombs. Just on, talk in to them. Iraq. Stop and dropping bombs on Muslims in in Syria, especially after they're already being bombed to bits anyway by their own government. I think that's a glaringly obvious kind of clue as to how to stop these kinds these groups from taking prisoners. We're going to have to go to a very short break before we bring our um, uh, next guest, Brother Dilwan Hussein, uh, who's a journalist and also a, a well-known blogger in the community, mashallah. Um, uh, he's going to be talking a little bit more about the same issue, and he'll be um, discussing. We want to uh, raise the question, if Alan Henning is you know a really important um, prisoner, a British prisoner. Um, are there other British prisoners out there that you know the rest of the world should be concerned about? Shouldn't David Cameron be worried about um, uh, uh, British prisoners like um, uh, the the uh, uh, Shakir Amir, who is now um, still in uh, Guantanamo Bay? Um, what about the Americans? Shouldn't they be worried about people like Afia Siddiqui and and many others? Um, so why is Alan Henning the only important British prisoner? With all due respect to him, and we've heard what what Ma- Brother Majid had to say about getting him released, but it, why is it only about Alan Henning and not about other British prisoners? So, if the producer is ready, we're going to go right now to a short break. Join us in a few seconds. Assalamu alaikum. In a world overrun by neocon warmongers, and with the mass media in the pockets of the cabal elite, there remains one bastion of truth amidst the confusion. One beacon of light shining through the murky fog of spin and Islamophobic propaganda. That's right. It's the NP Radio Security Council. The final frontier in the fight for freedom and fairness. I give you the Security Council. أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد عن فط الإيمان دربنا دربنا Middle قوي. Path Radio Your number one online Islamic talk station فيا إحساسنا أراه زاده التحنان فيا أبتغي حضن يتيم طاهر الروح نقيا فيا إحساسنا أراه زاده التحنان فيا أبتغي حضن يتيم طاهر الروح نقيا كي يحيل ظلمة القلب بإحساسه ضيا كي أرى غابات أيامي بأضلاعه فيا كي يروي خافقي من طهر أعماقه ريا حضن أطفال اليتامى يترك الوجدان حيا يملأ القلب حنانا دافقا دفءا نديا بين أرواح اليتامى يسكن الحب نقيا 
You're listening to the Security Council. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the Security Council. Um, if you've just tuned in, um, you listen to Security Council, which is live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. The beginning part of the show, we uh, had Brother Majid Freeman on, who was talking about um, the case of Alan Henning, the British hostage um, uh, or prisoner of ISIS. Um, and uh, now we're moving on to further discussions about Syria with our next guest, who is Brother Dilwar Hussein, or known as Dili Hussein, who is uh, a journalist specializing in uh, MENA politics, that's Middle East and North African politics. He's a deputy editor of Five Pillars, and is also blogger on Huffington Post. So we'd like to welcome Brother uh, Dil Hussein. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Akhi? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for uh, joining us on this show. Um, if you... If you've been listening obviously from the beginning, um, we've obviously had a, some discussion already regarding Syria um, and regarding Alan Henning. Um, and before we go more in depth into the kind of discussion about the U.S. airstrikes on uh, on Syria, we'd just like to know what your take on that discussion beforehand with Brother Majid and um, the issues in relation to Alan Henning. Okay. Uh, obviously, the situation uh, regarding Alan Henning is an unfortunate one. Um, he was someone who was left the UK to deliver aid and assistance to the Muslims of Syria and he was given the security of the Muslims who he was travelling with. Obviously we know it's a well established principle in the Sharia of Islam that uh, a non-combatant cannot be taken as a prisoner and definitely cannot be executed and if for some wild reason uh, that should be the case he should be given uh, a trial and due process. Uh, We're also aware that other rebel groups uh, tried uh, arbitrating on his behalf. Jabhat al-Musra sent a shari, uh, a jurist, to plead with ISIS for the release of Alan Henning. Um, so yes, it's an unfortunate case, uh, but with the previous execution videos of James Foley, Stephen Softloff, and David Haynes, is that we've noticed that the perpetrators clearly stated that it was as a result of foreign policy, as a result of arming the Kurdish Peshmerga and U.S. airstrikes. Um, so there we have it, really. That's the reason why they are holding him as hostage. Uh, but obviously we know very well that what they're doing um, is against Islam. They shouldn't actually be holding Alan Henning as a hostage. Uh, but that's the unfortunate reality that we have regarding Alan Henning. And with the U.S. airstrikes, which took place earlier today, um, I think that will worsen the situation. If for some reason uh, anyone believes that by carrying out military action against uh, ISIS would somehow release uh, the hostages that are currently in their in their possession, you're very wrong. If anything, it's, it's worse in the situation, and you, you ex- expect more beheadings and more executions of Western hostages. Yes, indeed. Um, so obviously, you've kind of touched upon the that key point, which is uh, it's important to understand there's a cause and effect of everything, and that. Uh, you know, these beheadings haven't just uh, kind of appeared out of nowhere. And we did kind of mention before, just in the earlier part of the show, which is that for Alan Henning, they've had him for the last, what, eight, nine months, ten months. You. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. If you can you speak up just slightly a bit louder. Okay, that's fine. Um, as we were talking about before in the uh, earlier part in the show, which is that they've had Ellen for the last kind of ten months, and obviously they haven't executed him, um, they haven't done nothing, and it's only now recently that everything's happening. So it's quite a very clear picture that there's a cause and effect here, that these beheadings aren't just happening by chance or just because they just want to kill all Westerners. Um, there, is, there is a reason behind it. It's important to understand what is the reason behind these actions taking place. Of course. Um, As we've seen, um, there were Italian hostages uh, that ISIS had. Uh, The government negotiated and they were released. Same with the French. Most recently with Turkey, there were 49 Turkish hostages that were released just a few days ago. So we can see that if negotiations uh, are done, uh, there is a possibility that hostages will be released. But in the case of the British and the US uh, citizens that are currently being held by ISIS, they have a policy of no negotiation with terrorists. That's their policy, right? Now, the reason why they are going ahead and now executing these hostages whilst having them in captivity for months is clearly as a result, again, as I stated earlier, as a result of the U.S. airstrikes, the result of military intervention. We know that military intervention in the Muslim world always results in negative blowbacks, whether it be at home or in the Muslim world. 
So the reason why James Foley, Stephen Sotloff, David Haynes, and Nathan Henning are being threatened, well, they've been killed and he's been threatened with execution, is because of the military actions and the decisions by Washington and London. And uh, this is why it's happening. This is why they are being threatened. So obviously, a difference between many different Western countries. Like you said, majority of the Western countries have managed to get successful um, hostage releases and obviously the uh, UK and the US haven't. Just before we move on a bit more, I just want to re- remind our listeners, um, please do call, text or WhatsApp in on 07477080248. That's 07477080248. You can alternatively also email us at info at middlepathradio.com or you can go onto our Facebook or to our Twitter. Both of them are Middle Path Radio. Um, Brother Khabab, sorry, uh, Brother Dili, this is uh, Brother Ahmed, another um, uh, one of the hosts uh, of the Security Council show. Um, uh, g- glad to have you with us um, uh, on, on, on Middle Path Radio. Um, uh, I just wanted to add here from all the important things you've, you've just said. We were reading before, when we opened the show today, tonight, sorry, um, uh, we were reading from Al Jazeera's article about the uh, airstrikes uh, with, by the Joint Allies of Obama. And um, Al Jazeera's Imran Khan um, reporting from Baghdad, he was saying, an open quote, he was saying that, that this was actually a doctrinal shift by ISIS. Previously, they maintained that they weren't at war with the U.S. and its allies and that their key goal was to strengthen the caliphate, end quote. So um, do, you, do you agree with that kind of comment or do you think that they were always you know, out there to you know, hell bent on the destruction of uh, America and, and, and the U.K. or wherever else? Oh, look, at the end of the day, I think we have to make something very clear here. ISIS wasn't, they didn't fall from the sky. They were initially created and they were given birth as a result of the U.S. led invasion of Iraq in 2003. That's right. Now, whether it's, now whether it's ISIS, uh, ISIS caliphate, which they claim to have established, or any other caliphate, mm. a caliphate is an expansionist state. So it would naturally threaten uh, the borders of the regional countries. Uh, borders and countries that were created by Britain and France uh, during World War One in the sykes pico Agreement. So obviously the Arab states that have allied with the U.S. who carried out the airstrikes uh, earlier today, they've got their own interests to protect. They've got their own borders to protect. So this was actually a case of harm and benefit. Um, so if it's... I wouldn't necessarily say ISIS was went out all out war with America. I don't, I don't believe that was their initial plan. Their initial plan was obviously to establish an Islamic State and naturally that Islamic State would expand. I would also like to note that ISIS was loosely a part of a wider uprising in Iraq against the sectarian, uh, despotic, brutal regime, Iraqi regime, which is backed by Iran, armed and trained and funded by the US. So uh, it wasn't necessarily ISIS alone in Iraq. ISIS was loosely a part of a genuine Sunni Arab tribal uprising against uh, the Maliki government. So, um, in terms of the, uh, you've obviously mentioned that um, ISIS, when they started off, this wasn't the intention. USA or the West weren't necessarily their their enemy, or or not their not their, the people, the focal point of their attack. Obviously, their their mission was a bit more different. Um, but what do you see will happen now as a result of the airstrikes? Now, obviously, ISIS will shift in that. So, what, what do you, what can you foresee that w- that will take place now? Um, I'd like to make this. I'd like to highlight this also. It wasn't just ISIS that was attacked in the attack, uh, in the airstrikes earlier today. Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra headquarters were bombed, um, as was Ahl al Um What I think will happen now is that more Muslims uh, will flock to join these groups because. They will see homes destroyed. They will see innocent civilians killed. And this uh, increases the sympathy. It legitimizes groups like ISIS. And naturally, whenever there's Western intervention, military intervention in the region, um, armed resistant groups always gain the upper hand because it works on the sympathy of the people. Right? Now, what I personally think these airstrikes were intended to do, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying this, and many would probably think that, okay, you know, Baba Didi would be off the mark. Let's be serious. The U.S. informed the Syrian convoy to the U.N. that they are going to be carrying out airstrikes. On September 11th, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Syria, Faisal Maqdad, he said that Bashar al-Assad had absolutely no problem whatsoever if America was to carry out 
because they believed that they were fighting a common enemy. So whilst we hear uh, the mainstream media say that, you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad is a, is, is a brutal dictator and he's an enemy of the West and the West wants to overthrow him, I personally think that the plan all along was to quell and thwart any kind of Islamic uprising. And when I say Islamic uprising, let's just forget the red herring of ISIS for a moment. Right? ISIS is not the only group that is fighting in Syria. ISIS is not the only group that is trying to uh, remove uh, the regime in Iraq. There are other Sunni groups, there are other Sunni tribal movements that are trying to um, overthrow uh, oppressive regimes. So these airstrikes that took place earlier today, I personally think that they were initially planned to thwart and quell any kind of Islamic uprising. And nor do I believe that this was uh, an issue of last resort. I just think it was a waiting game. The U.S. was simply waiting to carry out this military action. They've been itching for this. So is this... For three years, nearly four years, Bashar has been butchering his own people. Yet there's no, there's no movement, there's, there's not even a squeak. But as soon as uh, ISIS and as soon as uh, other groups were gaining momentum, you know, this is when they decided to move. And I also personally think, and I'm, I'm probably quite ruthless in saying this, but I think that the, the execution of uh, the U.S. journalists and David Haynes, these, these work in the favor of uh, the Obama uh, administration and the British government to further their foreign policy agenda in the region. So kind of justify the actions, collateral damage. Yes, of course. But okay. that, that initially gave them the green light to go in. You know, when this could have been avoided, uh, it no, should have I, taken heed from other other countries, other Western countries that negotiated and got their hostages released. This just shows how much they actually care about the life of their citizens. You know, absolutely. I think I know you you you're saying that you, you know many of our listeners might think that you're off the mark on this, or you're being ruthless in uh, perhaps describing the United States administration and their agenda in in the region. Um, uh, I just want to say, actually, that's what we've been uh, saying on our show for the last um, couple of weeks now, and we totally agree. And I, I certainly do. I do think that the whole ISIS thing is just a bogeyman. It's just a uh, red herring. It's nothing really to do with their pol- the uh, the Western policy in the Middle East hasn't changed. It has always been to kind of protect their interests and their allies, like Assad and previously Hosni Mubarak and others. And this Arab Spring kind of uh, pre- you know uh, presented a kind of uh, threat in maybe possibly changing the status quo of Arab dictators who do the uh, bidding for the uh, Western uh, governments, basically. And uh, they've always wanted to um, stop uh, any kind of revolution against Assad or or, 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 or uh, Hosni. At the end of the day, uh, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, no. Bashar al-Assad has been in power before the revolution started in 2012, early, 2000, uh, early 2011. When the revolution started, Bashar al-Assad had been, had been in place, had been in power for many years. He did not threaten Israel. He did not threaten any kind of interest, U.S. interest in the region. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's not. He's not posed any realistic threat. And I know we hear it's a very common argument that you know uh, the Hezbollah and Iran and with the help of Russia and Syria they present an axis of resistance. Mm-hmm. They don't present any kind of resistance. But that doesn't that doesn't say that you know the other Arab states who are naturally proxies of the West. Um, none of these Muslim countries pose any kind of threat. They are merely there to protect the U.S. interests, right? Um, and furthermore, everyone is well aware that George W. Bush's exit strategy for Iraq was to carve it up into three states, yeah? A Shia-led uh, state in the south, mm-hmm. a predominantly Sunni state in the center, and a Kurdish north, right? Now, I personally see that Obama is really finishing off what his predecessor couldn't. Right? right, and what happened was that when they felt that maybe ISIS was um, assisting and helping towards this three-state solution for Iraq, then they realized, you know what, we can't actually contain these guys. Nor can we actually contain the genuine sentiment of the Muslims of, to bring about an Islamic change. And ISIS has just been used. ISIS has been used, as you said, as a bogeyman, right, mm-hmm. to basically depict and and demonize the concept of a khilafah, which is one that is at the core belief. Of Muslims, right? Whether you're Sunni, even the Shia believe in an imamate, or in Sufi, whether you're a Sufi, no matter what theological or political background you come from, there is no denial that the Khilafah is a core Islamic belief. And they've used ISIS's claim to demonize this, and they've used it as a red herring, and they've used it in their favor to go in and, and uh, carry out military action. That's right, because right now it's not about Assad, it's not about the innocent civilian lives, the Syrians and the Arab Spring or the revolution and, and t- dictatorship. It's all about 
ISIS. You know, it's, nobody's talking about Syria anymore. Nobody's talking about the dead uh, 200,000 uh, Syrians. Everybody's just talking about ISIS and their so-called and, victims. And the irony is that predominantly majority of the Ummah, for numerous reasons, right, have rejected ISIS as a claim for Khilafah. But who That's right. gives it credence and legitimacy? First of them are the Islamically. Who is first of <laughs> them are the Caliphate? It's the Western media. That's right. It's the Western government. Uh, every, you know, the, whether it's the religious establishment in Saudi, whether it's Al-Azhar, whether it's Al-Qaeda themselves, whether it's other um, internet organizations that have been working with the establishment of the Khilafah for decades, across the board, Muslims have rejected ISIS claim to Khilafah. But unfortunately, all we're hearing on the news and by Western government is, you know, Islamic State, Islamic State, Islamic State. It's intentionally uh, manufactured and again to use it uh, as a reason to go into the region, you know. One last question, um, Brother Dilli, uh, Brother Dilwar, sorry. Um, what I was going to ask you is, you know, what you've just described there is a, a kind of a sensitive or fine balance. On the one hand, as you said, Muslims, you know, do disagree with what ISIS is doing, have actually spoken out. On the other hand, some, you know, one could argue that this kind of um, rhetoric could actually play into the hands of the Western powers. How do you advise, do you think will be a good strategy to maybe address the, the issue of ISIS uh, on, on the one hand, and obviously without giving uh, a license for the American government and the UK government to go bombing you know, Muslim countries across the world? Well, I've been very clear about this. I've written about this. I've, I've uh, appeared on numerous uh, television interviews, and I've made this very clear. We should remain steadfast and uncompromising on the concept and the belief of the Khilafah. This is, this is unquestionable. We as Muslims um, may condemn or criticize ISIS's action, but we do not condemn their political thoughts. Because their political thought is one that's very similar or one that every Muslim holds. Every Muslim wants a Khilafah. Every Muslim wants a Caliphate. That's every right. Muslim wants a state where they can make Hijrah to a living security. However, we should not fall into this trap of continuously condemning ISIS. And as some scholars have gone, have gone as far as to call them Khawarij and make takfir on them, this is very dangerous. We cannot uh, hold, uh, tarnish the whole group, you know, and uh, make them out to be agents or kafir or kafari. We can't. This is very dangerous. The fine line between criticizing particular actions from a Sharia perspective but also at the same time being very careful as to not just following the Western narrative. And that is that, you know, ISIS is the bogeyman. They are the problem. Because once we start repeating and parroting the, this narrative, then it basically gives uh, a green light and consent uh, to what uh, America and the British government and other Western countries are planning to do. Jazakallah khair. I think, you know, that have been very comprehensive on the, the variety of issues. But the Khabbab... Um, uh, your your final say on this, and uh, we can let Brother Dili be on his way, inshallah. Again, <clears throat> I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head a lot there, uh, Brother Dili, um, in terms of the impact that these airstrikes will have, the the uh, and uh, and the real nature of ISIS and how the media have kind of propagated and uh, ISIS to and made them into something bigger than they are, this big monster. And like you said. This is one of the key things that we did mention before, that kind of destroying these terminologies or tainting them, like the way they've been tainting the, the, the flag and the emblem of Prophet Wasallam, you know, by saying this is the ISIS flag and the Shahada flag needs to be banned and, you know, Khilafah and this concept, oh, this is wrong and uh, how Obama is mentioning that I will ensure that a Khilafah will never be established as long as I am president and, you know, the, the, these kind of things are becoming about and so they are slowly, slowly depicting and trying to dismantle core beliefs and core concepts within within the religion. Jazakallah khair. Um, uh, Brother Dili, if you, um, uh, you know, we've been very happy, very appreciative that you've actually taken the time out today. It's very late in the night and, um, you know, um, we really appreciate it. Jazakallah khair. Hopefully we can have you again uh, on our show. Uh, Shalom, or even maybe you may be able to have your own show uh, with us on Yeah, that uh, would be on, on really radio, even interesting. <laughs> that would be really interesting. <laughs> Barakallah wa fiqh to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So um, uh, that was, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, two very important calls, um, uh, you know, that we've just taken here on the Security Council. And uh, like we said, you know, some shows uh, we have a good laugh and some shows, mashallah, we're talking strictly business. And um, alhamdulillah, this show, we got some, you know, serious, uh, you know, calls um, uh, from uh, very important I I people who um, know their stuff. 
when it comes to the topic of Syria. Uh, a, a aid worker himself who's been to Syria doing aid work, who's seen for his own self what's happening, what the Assad regime have been doing. Oh, you might be surprised I didn't say ISIS. Yes, I mean, it's Syria is about Assad regime and the um, crimes that he's committed. And that's what people go and see when they go and go into uh, Syria. They don't go, go, go and see, you know, civilians in their uh, mass graves killed by ISIS. What they do see is, you know, what the people of Syria are complaining about is the Assad regime, right? And, and, and he's also had direct contact with uh, Mr. Alan Henning. And he's been in a unique position to really tell us about who this man is and what, you know, what he, at least from the apparent of things, can deem motivated him to go to Syria. He seemed to be a charitable man who was, uh, you know, altruistic in his effort to go and help um, uh, the, the innocent that, uh, people that were being killed, not by ISIS, but were being killed by Assad. Okay, people forgetting the Assad element in this, and really that's the only element when it comes to Syria. Now, alhamdulillah, we had the... Um, the prominent journalist, Brother Dilwan Hussein, who's just uh, spoken only a few seconds ago and really hit the nail on the head here. Um, and it's something that we've been saying here that this is no, why is it a surprise to us at all? This has been the Western foreign policy in the Muslim world for the last 50, 60 or even longer than that year. Since the um, uh, uh, British Empire, they've had the same policy, which is to prop up um, uh, pi- uh, puppet um, uh, tyrants to have these proxy um, governments of of theirs doing the bidding and the work of the uh, UK government and the work of the U- US administration and um, uh, you know they 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 certainly weren't pleased when they heard about the Arab Spring they were certainly very much um, you know apprehensive when they found out that some of these revolutions decided to become armed and were removing. After years and years, decades, you know, thirty something years plus of the ruler, the the rule of one man, who wasn't chosen by the people of that country, um, so the 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 um the the powers that were, they definitely you know saw this as a threat because as we heard and we we referred to the articles um uh, that were um reporting, Mossad former Mossad chief declaring that Assad is Israel's man in in the Middle East, in Syria. Um, So this is absolutely... And again, Brother Dili um, dispelled that um, so-called concept out there that, yes, actually, you know, the the Iranians, Hezbollah, Assad, these are the vanguard of Muslim defense in the the Middle East. They're the ones, you know, upholding, you know, their frontier... Uh, the yes, and right. Protecting the and they're opposed to Israeli aggression and stuff like that. But actually, if you look all the way back to what happened with the invasion of Iraq um, uh, by George W. Bush, um, we saw they favoured the Shia government. They again put in place, imposed a Shia government there. Okay, that's exactly what they did. They did not like an Islamic government, and the Shia seem to be natural allies in those regions. There was this so-called talk about the so. I don't, you guys should remember if you were following the news, Muqtada Sada. And his Mahdi army, as they referred to, referred to it, actually it's supposed to say the Mahdi, Jaysh al Mahdi, okay, of Muqtadr Sadr. But uh, you know what happened? All this so-called um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, saber rattling coming from the Shia camp. It all disappeared, and they decided, they were the ones who were given the government at the time, and they and they're the ones still in in power. Not that particular group, but um, those who are politically affiliated to them. So we need to go to kind of like a um, a break very shortly, and uh, hopefully we'll come back. And we've got a variety of different other things to talk about. Some of them still related, and others not so related. We will see you straight after this break. You're listening to the Security Council. A zero bull, straight talking, current affairs program. Allah is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. His power was true before all things and the birth. We are all creations that He created. Nothing goes past Him, He is the exalted. His power and might is reality. All that we receive are through His mercy. A leaf does not fall except of His grace. Trials and tests and all things that we face. Ah, 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 ah
Allahu 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 Allah Allahu 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 Allah Allahu 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 Allah A day will come that we will surely see all life in the earth including you and me A day of fear and calamity all creation will stand before the almighty none will speak standing with fright aware of the end close to the sight either the gardens of bliss or the fires of hell it is Allah's decision that no one can tell Ah, Allahu, 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 Allah, Allahu, 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 Allah, Allahu, 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 Allah. O Ummah, today we are weak and oppressed But remember Allah has allowed this If you fail in your deeds and don't follow Islam Allah's wrath will descend upon all of those lands If you lie, you must follow Muhammad Allah will love you, forgive you like he has said Don't make the world your home in the test Make it the heaven of Allah and end that is best Ah, Allahu, 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 Allah, 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 Allahu, 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 Allah. overrun by neocon warmongers and with the mass media in the pockets of the cabal elite there remains one bastion of truth amidst the confusion one beacon of light shining through the murky fog of spin and islamophobic propaganda that's right it's the NP radio security council the final frontier in the fight for freedom and fairness i give you the security council assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi uh, welcome back to the security council this is middle path radio uh, i want to urge all our um, brothers and sisters uh, all our listeners uh, ladies and gentlemen whoever they are to call us text us or send us a whatsapp message on 0747080248 that's 0747080248 we know you're all listening because we got the analytics and stuff so we need you guys to contribute there's been some hot topics being discussed we had two guests uh, just earlier and uh, they've covered a variety of different things if you agree call in if you disagree absolutely by all means you have to call in or drop us a text inshallah and tell us no no i disagree with brother um majid or i disagree with you brother ahmed or i disagree, you know I, I think maybe there's another way of looking at it you, you know brother Dilly had an angle on it i've got another angle on it so again the number is 07477080248 that's 0747080 Two four eight. Not to forget, please do follow us on Twitter, and we do have the hashtag Django of the Week. What is um, this Django? Django. Come on. All of our listeners right. don't know. Is Django? Okay. You know, Django's a hero, man. Django <laughs> Unchained. <laughs> These <laughs> guys. Why well, are you making? Well, well our Django is without the D, and this is not all Django. So this is another film. Django. No, no, it's not that. Or same so this one. is a Django with no D. It's just a J. That's right. It's a J A N G O. That is it. Ah. Django of the Week, and this is effectively our Hall of Shame. You could say that those who have hit the headlines in the week, and we're looking at the worst culprit, the yeah. number one, the, the worst of them, um, he will get this title, or uh, you can say, or this award of uh, Django of the Week. So and we've made a short list. You know, we've we, we made a short list. And in our first week, what we had, we had uh, uh, the GQ Philanthropist of the Year 
Tony Blair, the war monger, uh, as uh, AKA the, the war cri- criminal, you know, criminal. You know many AKAs. I'm AKA sure he has. the fugitive. You know, so um, he was he won the first kind of uh, uh, Django of the week, and I think last week we had a uh, iPhone six as the Django of the week. <laughs> Steve Jobs and uh, Tim Cook did a um, duet on that one. But uh, again, this week, please do. The list is there on Twitter. It's currently going to be from the choices of uh, the ones oh, that we the ones that we have shortlisted, which yeah. I won't again name. Please do go and check and put your vote in, and then Let, let's, let's give our listeners just the names um, so that people know. Um, okay, well, who they the are. list is it's uh, number one. You have is uh, President Obama after his launching of the U.S. strike with his Avengers Assemble. And I think that's a point which uh, Brother Dilly did a very nice article actually before right. on on uh, I think it's Huffington Post uh, about Avengers Assemble, and that's exactly what's kind of happening here. They're all assembling in order to attack Syria. So again, um, Obama was one. Number two, I think, was the well, EDO. But overall, the the paedophile you could say from um, the English Defence League, since obviously that hit a bit of a some headline. Or actually, it wasn't many headlines. Very um, uh, low key media it kind of er- arose in. Um, the third one was recall my memory, brother Ahmed. It's uh you know we, we haven't touched it. We are going to talk about it. It's uh, regarding the uh, police. In, uh, in, Rotherham. Ah, in Rotherham and uh, we're going to put that one to uh, the producer because that's a, a <laughs> nom- nomination of, of, of the Mr. candidate producer. that was given or put forward by the producer so uh, that would be quite interesting to see uh, definitely, <laughs> his definitely. take on that and obviously number four anyway before we quickly move on is um, regarding the Camden School the, the school which we'll be again discussing very shortly um, which uh, preventing uh, a student from wearing a and continuing her A-levels but we'll come to that topic a bit later but please do get onto Twitter hashtag Jungle of the Week put your votes in end of the show we'll, hear the, we'll, we'll announce who the winner is um, there's a couple of points oh brother Ahmed, I so wish... Just, just on the Django of the week, okay. you know, I think we should keep it a bit more flexible, you know. If our listeners want to tweet, uh, add somebody to this nom- list of nom- uh, no- nominees, tweet, use in front of him. Uh, so, um, it's open, I'm tweet, looking at add, it. And uh, suggest another name. Maybe these four are good enough. They don't make the, you know, they don't fit. If you think that... Indeed, if you don't think enough, that these guys are good enough, any big criminal you can think of that can before you go on to some of the hot topics that we did talk about, I do want to mention something we should have probably said in the beginning of the show. One of the permanent members of the Security Council is not here today, okay? And that is brother Zain. Indeed, now, we the Mugabe is down and out. Is Ebola this time or is farmers? I'm not sure. What exactly is going down with with Brother Zain? I think Brother Zain needs to give us a little, drop us a line and let us know why. <laughs> it's quite unacceptable. And uh, another revolution may start again. Why is he texting me, uh, you know, all these different <laughs> messages? Right? Because he's got access to the uh, show. He needs to call in and, you know. Coming back. Um, that's right. Uh, Cafe Juan has suppressed that revolution. Cafe Juan here, the, the revolution. Um, uh, Viva Cafe Juan. So I was going to say that Brother Zane just informed me actually, you know, we all know um, uh, here in Middle Path Radio that uh, Brother Zane is actually going to Hajj, inshallah, tomorrow. Um, that is the reason why he's uh, you know, extremely uh, preoccupied. He's taken his family. He's asked us to make dua for him, especially tonight. He's, uh, one of his child is, is uh, in hospital and they have to actually make journey tomorrow morning. So um, obviously we wish him all the best. If he's listening, which I know he is, then make, make dua, for, dua us. for us, inshallah. Uh, especially uh, me by name, inshallah, <laughs> Brother Zain. <laughs> okay, you know who it is. Um, I need the dua, inshallah. And uh, obviously that will also mean for the next couple of weeks, Brother uh, Zain won't all be on our show. It will be just uh, myself, um, Khabbab, and uh, uh, Brother Ahmed will be on the show. But Brother Ahmed, yes, there's a few points the which I want to go back to in relation to some of the kind of discussions that we had uh, beforehand. But again, just a quick reminder, please do... Um, text call WhatsApp zero seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight zero seven four double seven zero eight zero two four eight. What I wanted to discuss was in relation to Anne Henning. Obviously, you you, you kind of touched upon it very briefly before, which is that what about the other kind of British hostages and prisoners? What about the other American prisoners around the world? Uh, you know, and what's what's the big fuss about Alan Henning? And another key thing, which and that very much links in with um, what Brother Dilly was mentioning. In relation to how Alan Henning is just effectively, it's ser- or, or you could say the beheadings of James Foley and others, kind of served in the interest of the Americans and the British. And same kind of thing here. If you look at it, we've had before, and we knew from one of our own, a Muslim aid worker. So here we've got Alan Henning, who's a non-Muslim aid worker. We're talking about a Muslim aid worker, a doctor, Doctor Abbas Khan, mm-hmm. 
who went to uh, uh, Syria. It was clear he was there from uh, you know for, uh, aid work. Even all the doctors just hours before were saying he was just in surgery helping. You know, saving lives, and, and then, then ISIS was, killed him. And no, he wasn't ISIS. It wasn't ISIS. He wasn't. Uh, who, who else could it be? I mean, it's only ISIS, right? You know. Well, this is. Uh, you know, you be dumbfounded when I actually was. By what rock have I been living under? You know, uh, but by the by the Assad Isaac. regime. You know, Assad. Yeah. You Who's know, that? You know, you know, the, you know the criminal. You know, the one who's been killing people. Yeah, maybe you've forgotten. You know, you, you mean to say Assad has killed a British aid worker like Alan Henning? He's not only killed a British aid worker. He's killed two, over two hundred thousand of his own people. That's right. Except this British aid worker isn't exactly white no he's like not Alan he's a bit you know uh, you know he's got a different skin color and he's got a different name and hang, oh, lo and, and behold a it's Christian. a muslim he's sounding a muslim. name uh-huh. so this was obviously a, a very serious issue and it was on the it was a lot of the headline news again he was there saving lives he was picked up by the syrian regime and what did the british government really nothing that he's did lost squat. all you know that's what his mother lost all you know hope and possibility of support from the government or the consulate mps and all that she went all the way a woman who you know, English isn't her first language. Someone who's gone over there into Syria. Syria, who cannot even speak the native language, cannot speak a word of Arabic, and she's gone searching from prison to prison, to police station to police station, until she found it to try and get him released. And just before he's released, he was murdered by the Syrian regime, you know, and, and set up to look like a suicide. You know, all the signs are very much clear that this was not a suicide. This was a man who had everything to look forward to. He was just about to be released to children and his family, and he was he was killed. And nothing was said. The, what did the government say? You know, nothing. They did nothing. So same kind of. So thing you mean here. to say that uh, the co- this uh, the Avengers didn't assemble to do airstrikes on Assad? They didn't. Yeah, amazingly, no, they didn't. And uh, anti-war, I, I feel very of non-violent. Of course, and I think they were all talking about, oh, we've learned our and oh, we've learned yes, our yes, lesson yes. on these kind of things. And no, we mustn't do that kind of thing know, again. We, I understand. We can't do that. You know, it's it's not possible. Except here we are today with some uh, airstrikes uh, in Syria uh, on uh, you know in. Uh, you know, in the face of these so-called, you know, I'm going to say out, out, outright, the face of these lies that we mustn't make the same mistake in that we made in Iraq. Yet there you are again in Iraq doing airstrikes, still killing people, still innocent civilians are getting caught up in this. And exactly that is the key point here, which is a clear case. That's one thing. And the second thing is they don't care. In all honesty, I know for a fact the British government do not give, you know, uh, two monkeys about Alan Henning. And that's the sad, that's a brutal reality of it. And that's the sad truth. Because if they did, they would have got him released by now. Just like the French, just like the Germans, just like the Italians have. It's in their interest that he gets killed. So that they can say, yeah, this is why we are in Syria, dropping bombs there. And no. in Iraq, and again. everybody, and more so, everybody's been in, in uproar regarding this. You, you've, recently we saw the video of the, uh, the Muslim scholars, you know, Imam Sheikh Qaitham Haddad and so forth, came out very much clear. You know, this is wrong. This is completely wrong and Islamic. You know, Muslim communities have come out. Everybody's come out. Mm -hmm. You know, where us people, you could say, you know, living here in the West, in in the UK, we've done whatever we can. And unfortunately, there's nothing more we can do. And whatever we say won't really have an impact. It's only going to be because the ball is in the Because the responsibility was never really ours in the first place. So the point being is, you know, whatever you can to try and support and try and get gear that support up and try and change uh, the mindset, you can say, has been done, but the ball is currently in um, David Cameron's court, and unfortunately, he's not going to play that ball. And that's that's very clear. I think, you know, it's, it's a sad reality, you know, that he won't play that ball. He will actually wait and hold on to it until Alan Henning gets killed, and then he can only further justify his uh, support for the airstrikes and the UK support for the US-led airstrikes in Syria, because this was the key objective that they've had in mind from day one. And one of the things we, again, you touched upon, which I was quickly going to say before we move on, I know I've got a little bit of saying now, Yeah. Um, regarding the Arab Spring, like you mentioned, this was the worst thing that could have happened. The US couldn't have predicted how, you know, a small little kind of uh, issue in Tunisia then kind of rose to this whole Arab Spring, which changed the demogra- you know, the, the face of uh, the Arab world, and it really shook them because these were their leaders, these were the people who they had in power, their you know, their puppets, and now they're getting taken down one by one, and now you know you're talking about and it's being done not by you know isis it's being done by the vast majority of the mainstream population but of even those if you're countries the people they've obviously done this revolution but this was a big problem and they've obviously sat around the table thinking how can we resolve this problem and if you look at it now the revolution what back in 2011 it started something like that yeah, early 2011 um, yeah. when it kicked off um, three years ago you know it's, it's, it's been over three years and now it looks like the, in the west have got back to the position that they wanted to be in 
in Egypt, you had uh, 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 Muhammad Mursi coming to power, and they've uh, you know comfortably managed to get rid of him and without any kind their, of armed you know, revolution. And they've got their dictator anything. back in power, just a different face, but it's, it's still it's still the same system, same corrupt thing. That's right. In Libya, they've just caused anarchy and havoc, and now it's just infighting between different tribes. No ruler there. They're more than happy with that. Eventually, they're going to need a very strong hand, a fist to come in and again rule over Libya again as a d- d- dictatorship. Same thing in Tunisia, and then you look at Yemen. Yemen, okay. That's it. I, I just wanted to talk about Yemen just quickly because I know it's a little bit uh, related and a little bit not not related. But this relates to the point I was making before the break, which was this so-called um, uh, you know uh, imprint that the, the the Muslim world are in that somehow the the um, Hezbollah, um, the Iranian government, they by the way declared their Islamic state many many years ago, all right, and they have a caliph who is in uh, in in Iran. Okay, so um, uh, you know this is kind of like strange that people are talking about this uh, a group as so-called Islamic State when the Shiites have been doing this for for many many years. Okay, and they're uh, they're you know they are recognized by the Western world and they negotiate with them on many things. And we covered the story here earlier that the Iranians and the um, American administration are working together to do airstrikes uh, in Iraq and also in in Syria. So we have the Shiites in Iraq. Okay, currently doing the Americans' bidding and uh, being the reason for the rebel groups to have been born. One of those rebel groups, from the many groups, is ISIS, okay, born in Iraq, because of this Shiite regime. And also, similarly, you had this, the scenario with what's happening in Syria, which Assad and his government and his forces and his militiamen, all of these militiamen, they all hail from a Shia background, okay, albeit perhaps a different um, branch of Shiism, but still a Shiite background, okay, and they have strong, very strong links, as we know, Iran has got troops inside Syria, um, uh, uh, Hezbollah forces are in Syria fighting um, um, the, the, uh, the revolutionaries there and killing innocent civilians there as well, well-known reports, and now we hear about Yemen, what's happened in Yemen? So again, with the Yemen, in terms of you can talk about the revolution that uh-huh. that, that kind of took place there. That's right. It was very much quelled because it just got rid of the leader worked out very much, you know, uh, uh, scotch free, you can say. And then um, he walks in another individual who is currently now leading the country. Mm-hmm. Um, it's no different, in all honesty, to what was there before. And so that quelled that revolution. But just the point I was trying to get to. Then you come to Syria, which has been the bigger. Mm-hmm part of the revolution which has lasted a lot longer obviously and it's becoming to a very much a armed conflict with the other ones not so much maybe Libya to a smaller extent and this is obviously a big concern and from Syria what has also arisen has been the, Is- the Islamic front you know you're talking about Islamic fighters people who are fighting against Assad and their overall goal is to get rid of him and then to do what? Is to establish... I mean, they're Muslims. You know, so obviously they're going to be Islamic. So you know, people, in, is to, is to people in the Islam. Muslim world kind of tend to be Muslim. Yes. So I think that's quite a difficult equation for a lot of people to get their head around. But yes, if you're going to have rebel groups, you know, a billion of different different rebel groups with different names, they're all going to kind of tend to be Muslim in all down to the fact that they're still Muslim. At the and end of the day. they're Muslim and they're yeah. fighting, f- you know, and the point they is... They might have different goals. Yeah, they might have different goals. The majority methods. of them are are fighting in order to overthrow Assad and to over what established Islam in the country. Yeah. You know, so this is this is the aim and objective. And now this is the threat to the US. The reason why it goes back to this whole argument I've had a uh, discussion I've had many times, this is the whole continual battle between truth and falsehood, between haq and batil, between mm-hmm. light and darkness. And this is simple as that. That as far as they are concerned, they the, the you know you're talking about uh, the enemies of Islam know that Islam is a threat. And this is a threat that they can't kind of uh, accept. Ignore. So they've been waiting for a door, a way to slowly kind of walk in and legitimize. Because if you go straight in and you start bombing the rebels, you say, hang on a minute, you're siding with Assad, who's killing so many of his people. That's not going to work for their PR. Enter so, the ISIS. Argument. So amazingly, ISIS pops up and is giving them that legitimacy to now go in there and do what? Bomb the rebels, mm-hmm. and like we've seen from today, not only have they just not, they've not bombed ISIS, they've gone and bombed other rebel groups, yeah. and it's going to keep on spreading. And now, what this has become is that this is the biggest turning point. Although we knew this behind the doors, it's been happening. This is now the official public turning point where the U.S. are now hand in hand with the Syrian regime against the rebels. That's right, and we talked about this and only so a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, Arab Spring, 
it's all finished now. They're more than happy. Arabs think, oh, a couple of years of turmoil, but now they're probably laughing, you know, in their, you know, uh, kind of smoke ridden rooms, you know, <laughs> with their big cigars uh, after their Avengers have assembled, thinking, you know, yeah, well done, job done. Finally, we're going back to where we want to be. Wouldn't to uh, give ISIS a pat on the back. But in all fairness, really, to be honest with you, they didn't really need ISIS. We saw in the uh, invasion of Iraq, they went there on purely illegitimate reasons. They didn't have any legitimate basis at all for going. To. It was just a case of like, okay, last time we kind of got away scot-free, uh, you know, going to war and destroying a country. You know, not a small small affair that. This time round, if we were to say, let's go back to Iraq, guys, I think the people are going to be very ticked off. They better have a brilliantly good reason, compelling reason, as to why they would agree with going back to dropping bombs in Iraq and now a new country and dropping bombs in Syria with people who have done nothing against America and the United Kingdom. Okay, so this is something that, you know, um, you've just uh, pointed out and that's really the agenda here. I think it's quite, um, uh, you know, clear as day that Muslims need to wake up and realize that this is not even to so much to do with oil. The oil is great. If we can steal a bit of the oil, that's great. Good stuff. Um, uh, but it's more to do with the ideological war that is taking place here. This is non-Islam being opposed to Islam. Okay, and the Muslim resurgence, Muslims finding their unity, Muslims um, identifying themselves w- according to their religion, Muslims trying to determine um, and be- come to a position of self-determination. This is something that the Western world doesn't want to see. Now, obviously, you know, when I say Western world, I'm not talking about everybody. As we can see, even Alan Henning was, was a guy who didn't think like that, didn't have those views. So we're, we're speaking loosely, and I have, you know, the confidence in the, in, in the intelligent, intelligence of our listeners that they're not making these kind of broad assumptions. You know, we're talking about the governments who are taking these types of decisions, Okay. Uh, to go to war in Iraq, to go to war in, in Syria and kill people there. So th- th- these are the kind of people that we're talking about. And it's absolutely right. We, we need to wake up and smell the coffee now. It isn't about oil. Yes, they steal the oil. It isn't about um, trade and what was it, you know, gold. or you know, It wasn't about these types of things. Where they were doing that kind of thing. They were taking that kind of stuff, those assets, those resources. But it's more to do with the fact that Muslims are finding themselves again you know, since the time of the Sahabas, the companions of the Prophet wasallam, since the rule of the um, Islamic, uh, uh, you know, leaders, you know, this is something that they successfully dismantled. Um, also, the Muslim world was uh, crippled from within with internal issues and problems. Also, kind of like a distancing, the Muslims themselves were kind of become distant, becoming distant from, uh, from, uh, you know, let's say, from God or Allah in general, from piety in general, and this kind of led to the uh, dismantling of the um, unity and the um, uh, infrastructure of the Muslim world. So absolutely, I totally agree with you there, Brother Khabbab, that um, that's the kind of thing that that's really the agenda in that region. And anybody who can protect their allies, i.e. Israel, okay, and anybody else like Assad, who are protecting the interests of Israel, then, um, uh, you know, anybody who opposes those people, then the Americans will move and act and the United Kingdom will be sure to follow, and as they have done today. So, the other kind of just points I just wanted to kind of link into the previous discussions. Uh, Obviously, we had our guests on the show, so we really couldn't talk too much to give them more airtime to kind of hear their views. Um, But I just thought the important points to kind of touch upon. And you might think that last couple of weeks you've been reiterating the same thing and again and again, but these are the underpinning, the underlying issues, and, and it's just important to drill it home and see what's happening for what it really is, and not be blinded and think, you know, oh, we don't like, you know, just, I think Brother Dilly made a very good point. Yeah, It's a very fine line between, you know, how we deal with ISIS. You know, we can't go around on the whole takfir bandwagon and start saying, oh, these guys are careful, these guys are khawarij, these guys are this and that. And, yeah, yeah, we support the airstrikes because, you know, it's important that you have to, you know, you know if the khawarij you have to kill them. And, you know, these kind of rhetoric we've been hearing. And this doesn't do good because I think even Sheikh Yusuf Al-Qardawi, you know, had a tweet, uh, was it a week or so ago, you know, in relation to he may, he said he disagrees with the ideology and the methodology of ISIS. But he won't support America in its attack against 
the Muslims because that's exactly what it is. At the end of the day, these US airstrikes, who are they going to kill? Muslims. You know, it's, it's, it's clear Innocent as that. Innocent civilians. Civilians will always, they have always died and they will continue to die. And not only that, even with ISIS, yes, I disagree with them. I, what they are doing, a lot of things that they're doing is wrong. But what they're going to be then doing is hitting all the other rebel groups who have been fighting against the tyrant Assad. You know, and that's what's going to happen. It's just going to, that's the whole aim of it is, is that, that, and that's exactly what's happening. And on so. that point that you just made about how, um, you know, we're going on this whole tech fear flex or we're going with this, uh, you know, um, uh, condemnation, uh, this, condemn that. Um, and again, we have talked about it before, but I wanted to refer to a uh, comment is free Guardian article um, uh, by uh, a lady, sister Ramona Ali, okay, in the Guardian.com. And she says in her titled article, it says, British Muslims shouldn't feel obliged to speak out against ISIS atrocities. Okay, in Europe, Britain leads the way in religious tolerance, but that could easily change, and prejudice seems to grow by the day. And I'm going to take just one paragraph out here um, about what she said about um, Muslims shouldn't feel obliged to condemn atrocities by ISIS. Well, she says here, I support initiatives like the UK Imams Against ISIS video, which featured Muslim leaders, both Sunni and Shia, coming together in condemnation, but it makes no sense to expect Muslims to apologize for crimes they played no part in. Muslims are as disgusted by them as any civilized person is. Okay, and she goes on to say that um, Hazel Blair's today called for more integration by British Muslims. Things are getting worse, but integration is not the issue here. It's bigotry and prejudice and a language exclusive to the far right. I still firmly believe, she says, that Britain is leading the way in Europe in its religious tolerance and inclusivity, but this could easily change. Now is not the time to get complacent about a prejudice that seems to get stronger by the day. And she cites some um, report here um, from a group that, you know, that records the Islamophobic attacks and, and so on and so forth. She said that this group has recorded more than 2,040 um, uh, instances of religious hatred since the group was formed in 2012. So in two years, there's been 2,040 reports of religious hatred, okay, including arson attacks on mosques would normally be called terrorism if it was a church. Um, you know, bombs would have been, they would have said this is a bombing, basically, including arson attacks on mosques and violence towards Muslim women. They increased in the months following the murder of Lee Rigby in Woolwich after the brutal killing of British aid worker David Haynes. This um, uh, group re received 39 hate incidences in just three days alone. Okay? They said that when something takes place in the UK or involves a British national, we, the Muslim community, we see the spikes in these reports, okay, uh, of Islamophobia and, and and stuff like that. These kind of attacks against Muslims, and it's predominantly Muslim women who are being, uh, you know, feeling the brunt. I, I am going to talk about that later on a little bit more, but I just wanted to stay on a um, related to our topic on Syria. One of the articles here, okay, on the Daily Fail, excuse me, the Daily Mail. Um, they, they. Oh, uh, uh, that's a quite a little slip there, wasn't it? <laughs> that was a uh, Freudian uh, slip. Um, the Daily Mail, actually, well, because this is you know a, a well-known. Um, uh, I don't want to call them even a newspaper, but a, a well-known media organization. Tabloid, that, or tabloid, or, yeah, you know, trashy um, uh, site that actually you know uh, helps to promote a lot of the in, inadvertently the promote a lot of the Islamophobia, right-wing, racist, racist, you know, trash, trash basically. So. Yeah. so but they've said in this article here is titled U.S. Spy Planes. U.S. Spy Planes are flying over British skies in hunt for Jihadi John. Jihadi John's associates as the, as net closes in on London suburb. So j just listen to that. You know, U.S. Spy Planes are flying over British skies. What on earth <laughs> is going on? <laughs> What happened to the UK? They lost their backbone. They, they, they didn't got no spine. That they they let in the Americans spy over their own people, which is their own territory. And it's not even their own spy planes. It's the Americans. Some foreign country. Doesn't matter how friendly you are with them. You don't need to get them to be flying their planes to surveil, okay, uh, and do a recce on your citizens. What on earth is going on? 
either this is another example of Daily Mail, you know, fabrication, or it's absolutely true, in which case it's still bad in both instances. Okay, so I'm just going to read some of their, you know, headlines, you know, they've put in bullet points. They say, sources say British Jihadi has been identified and comes from South London. Believed his family members have been interviewed by Met Police and FBI. Spy planes are now flying over Britain in a bid to hunt down his associates. The aircraft are intercepting and analysing telephone and computer signals. Is thought to have been known to security services before he went to Syria. Okay, and that's really the kind of stuff that they uh, talked about. Saying here, you know, one of the in- interesting, so powerful. Um, I can get the direct quote. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, let's let's just I'll paraphrase it for you before. And it says that apparently these spy planes are so powerful that it can pick pick up for when you press a button. So as soon as, <laughs> so as soon as this you press a button, <laughs> so as soon as you press the keyboard button, that heat signature is you know detected by these American spy so planes. So they can actually see from the heavens, the rooftops into your basement flat, you know, uh, to the keyboard that you are typing. So they can actually see you type the word ISIS in your computer. Typing right now as we speak in the UK, in London, forget the UK. I know there are a lot of people typing away. They're forgetting, by the way, that there are touch screens that don't use buttons anymore. And you can do a lot of typing uh, on this. And sometimes it can be a bit straight, you know, not necessarily (laughs) facing up. up. So (laughs) with this right angle, you're a bit... uh, uh, Mr. (laughs) Producer. What's what going on? Say? Have you been typing tonight? No, I was just going to say, with all this technology, how long did it take them to find... Um... OBL? Yeah. It took them about 10 to 11 years. And, and all this technology was at, at their disposal. And two long wars come on, come on. that has no, cost no, no, them no, no, billions. 10 to 11 years. Come on, he's been on their hit list for many, many years. That's right. Obviously, he shot to probably number one after 9-11, but... You know, again, it shows all the technology in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. Again, if you know, if Allah doesn't will for you to find something, you're not going to find it. You're not going to get what you want. That's exactly. And sometimes happened. that's what they believe. They've got taken this whole level of be afraid, be very afraid. We are watching you. Almost this whole of you know the role of Allah. Allah is constantly watching you, and they're trying to make you fear them more than you fear Allah. No, you're afraid. Oh no, you know they're gonna catch me. They're gonna, you know, even if you're not doing anything, you're like, oh, they're gonna arrest me. I want to get in trouble. And all of these kind of things. But what about the fear of your Lord? You know, and this is what they're trying to do. This is really the attack on Tawheed as well. Yeah, it is, and uh, they they just want you to uh, get this impression that they're the all powerful um, kind all of seeing the all seeing, you know, uh, you know, entity in on 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 the planet, and um, you know, it's just to trying to like do create some fear mongering, while at the same time doing a double role, which is you know getting the people to become used to this whole so-called surveillance that is going on which they are doing and it's very invasive and a lot of the times it is not legal what they do and you know and we've we've heard about them uh, thanks to Julian Assange and especially now from Edward Snowden okay um we've heard uh, you know that they've breached many many of their own laws just to um uh, do these kind of things against their own public me- uh, members of public so um it's just getting people to get used to this idea that this is what we do. We do it for your good and for your safety. We're doing it to catch, you know, ISIS. So um, uh, this is, this is I democracy. hope you won't mind. We, you know, go through your laundry uh, while you're sleeping. That's what I mean. um, as long as we catch this an ISIS. Democracy in there. is finest, which is that we will invade your whole life and do everything that will, you know, take away all of your liberties. And guess what? You're going to give it to us. We're not going to take it. You're going to say, come, You're take our liberties. You're willingly going to give it say, away. Oh, no, no, no. ISIS are a big threat. No, hang on a minute. Oh, we need to protect ourselves. Yeah, by all means, you know, no problem. Look through my phone. Look through, you know. Come you have, into you my have, house. You know, I'll leave the door open access, for you. you know. No problem. You know, come into my bedroom. If you want, you can put cameras in my house. I don't got a problem. I've got nothing okay. to hide. That kind of thing. And then eventually you realize, hang on a minute. You're living in this big brother state, as they say. You know, where you have And you no are freedom. the target. It is not ISIS. And then you become the target. And, and we've seen it. When they want to, they will use it. The terrorism laws come in. And they say, oh, no, no, it's only affecting the Muslims and this kind of thing. And you saw it, what happened to... Uh, uh, Gre- Glenn Greenwald's um, partner. Yeah, partner. You know, uh, uh, I forgot his name now. Miranda. 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 David Miranda. David Miranda, I think he is. Yeah. You know, you see what happened to him. The anti-terror laws were then used upon him so they can seize information the computers, in that, the computer that, datas that would be leaked sensitive information which would be embarrassing very much to the to, to the uk so again this is the clear point
when they want, they would then use the right the, these legislations. At the moment, okay, the, the the group that's been used upon is the Muslim community, and a lot of non-Muslims might be thinking, oh yeah, don't worry, these guys just okay, it's only the Muslims. It's only the Muslims. But as you know, you will eventually come down to the point where they will use it on everybody for whatever they wish for it to. And that's only then that they will start to care. And you know, this is really shame that we have to even say, oh, it's only the Muslims. You know, co- uh, colloquially, or I mean, you know, very and um, even from the Muslim community, humorously. even from the Muslim community, it's not this. It's, oh, it's only those extremists, those radicals. Yeah, you even know. in the Muslim so community, so they dividing the Muslim community come and wake up you know it's nothing to do with Unite, those radicals you know, rally you know behind each you other know, you're, 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 fight you know, the power using the prop exactly <laughs> power to the, the power. people that's right you know. you know what's happening to people out there I'm really getting worried you know I think it's all because of the iPhone to be honest with you people are becoming so um, dumbed down they're waiting for Siri to do all the thinking for them. I just think that's that's really what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. iPhone six is not on the Django of the week this week, so please do refrain. I thought I'd, I'd throw that uh, curveball in there. You know, it had nothing. So to do we with have had a suggestion on, uh, via Twitter regarding uh, a Django of the week, really, uh, which would have been actually which hasn't been mentioned, which is um, a David Cameron, and the reason why he's there is purely because he's doing nothing to release, obviously. Alan Henning and his actions and his actions will actually in support of the US X right will only basically further condemn this innocent man to death. That's right. Uh, further further you know, jeopardize, you know, further jeopardize and, and him in, in And so again, that's another nomination that's come on the table for uh, so Django we'll of the David week. Cameron to that shortlist. And now we've got five uh, people on that list. Uh, I've just received a house Muslim proverb oh. uh, via text message. Would you like them? It's not as fancy ones, but it does say um, uh, house Muslim proverb, hashtag house Muslim proverb. Fortune, fortune favors the apologists. Uh, it's very similar in vain to the previous um, House Muslim proverbs. Apologize, sorry, don't delay. Apologize, apologize to today. An apology a day keeps, keeps Islamophobia, Islamophobia at, at bay. bay. So these are some of the uh, we're adding to this uh, list of House Muslim proverbs. So you know, again, we'll be tweeting them as yeah, well. So you please tweet, do. tweet those at us as well, um, and uh, it'll be interesting to get some of those um, House Muslim proverbs. Proverbs and um, uh, one of the uh, not recommendations sorry one of the votes that's come in for Django of the week I'll say this on air because it's what I'm not sure who it is um, well, I mean um, uh, the text says basically he wants to vote for uh, the house uh, Negro uh, he's referring to the White House and the house Muslim, m- yeah. Mr. Uh, no he's referring to Mr. Oh. Obama oh, oh, oh. Mr. Obama and uh, I believe Mr. Obama is in the list of uh, uh, of the the whole of Django's or the Django's um, Django of the week. So that's one vote we've already got. Somebody else has uh, voted for David Cameron. Okay, so if you've got more votes, please get them coming in. Hashtag Django of the week. Who do you think it is? And uh, you know, let, let's be clear. House uh, Muslim proverbs. We love those as well. Get them coming in. If you're wondering what does it mean, this House Negro is this an offensive term? Is this something really in- inappropriate? Is this in- politically incorrect? Just quickly want to say, obviously, you know, we we don't. It, it's not a racist term, okay? And we certainly don't tolerate any kind of racism. Uh, especially ourselves being part of a minority ethnic group and a minority religious group here in uh, where we are. Um, but I, I certainly don't think that was that is anything um, racial at all. In fact, um, uh, our African-American brother, Malcolm X, uh, later known by his f- uh, formal name, Shabazz uh, Malik, okay, who went to pilgrimage, as well, um, because we are right now in the pilgrimage season, in the Hajj season, and one of our co-hosts is probably going to make his journey. My brother is going to be making his journey tomorrow, inshallah, to to the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Baytullah, um, to do um, uh, their pilgrimage. But Malcolm X had said those words, and he said he did refer to those um, uh, Africans who were, you know, slaves who were extremely submissive of their towards their white masters. In fact, they were so submissive that they were promoting the um, uh, actions and the whole perpetuating the entire um, uh, slave mentality uh, and the master cadre system that they had in in, in place that the white people were uh, subjecting the black people to and um, they were always looking out for their white master and they were always concerned about the well-being of the white master and oftentimes, very often actually this particular house negro was the one responsible for doing the whipping and the disciplinary of other um, uh, black American African uh, African American slaves so they would be the ones doing the whipping and the lashing of other uh, Africans and blacks 
So um, uh, Brother Malcolm X actually referred to that particular um, uh, black man who did everything that the racist white man uh, would have done but didn't need to do because they had a black man who would do it for them. That guy is referred to as the house uh, Negro as opposed to the field Negro. We haven't got Just much to time. Just to kind of mention regarding yep. the Negro issue is uh, Malcolm X made it very clear. We, I think even Martin Luther King possibly even made, it, made that point as well, mm-hmm. which was um, the term Negro is a better term to use as opposed to the other N-word that were being used because that was a there derog- are three N words. You know that was one is nigger, which is a racist, which is term. a racist with derogatory. R. That's right. Term, you know, and he said we should move away and we should to make you know, sure that people know no, that we this need is to make racist sure term. that this is not acceptable and we shouldn't be. Uh, Negro is the correct term because this is what what was uh, you know as I recall Malcolm X was mentioning. You know, this is the term we should. I still wouldn't take it, take it, t- take know, it too kindly to term, white yeah, people course. referring to African without doubt or Caribbean people as Negro even then. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't think that's acceptable. However, um, I think it's it's different when a African American describes the um, uh, the what should I say the dog whistle um, uh, uh, Uncle Tom who's doing the beatings on behalf of his white master against the his own community and doing the bidding of his master. There. So that, that that's appropriate for for an African American or a person from an ethnic minority to refer to them. Like. There's another N word which is nigger, which is uh, how do they say? You know what I'm saying, my nigga, that kind of thing. That again is not a is not the same as the the other racist. But it's term. been derived from that. It Unfortunately, it's been derived from that. Afraid, and the yes. root, as you would start studied in your in in, in Arabic language, <laughs> <laughs> you know the root word and uh, its origins. It and did so, originate from so. the racist term. <laughs> However, its current use and the way it's written is different. The way it's being used today by people of the African American and now actually embraced by a lot of people from outside of the African American community. Okay, um, and uh, a lot is quite trendy to refer to one another's colleagues and you know what people say they're best friends and stuff like that as you know what's going on, my nigga, that, that kind of thing. But it's spelt N I G G A, so it's a bit different to um, uh, being racist. But again, we don't think yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to wrap up. We don't think that's something that you know, we want to be promoting. Um, uh, that's not you know a, a culture that like uh, that comes from a culture that has a lot of other baggage to there, and a lot of people forget the history or behind that. Word just like you correctly pointed out, brother Khabab. How much time do we have, Mr. We Producer? We have. Mr. Producer is almost, uh, you know, uh, about to pack up and go, despite us still being on air. He's saying two minutes. Well, wow, that is uh, very little time. So all I'm going to do is read the headlines. Then I ain't got nothing else. It's going to be like you know, um, other stories in tonight's uh, news. Well, I think happen. we might as well, since we talked about that jungle of the week, at least cover the EDO one and the Camden one very, very briefly, okay. so we can uh, at least give. That can, I, can, fairness, can you allow me to just go in that order that I uh, set up already, uh, so that way we do justice to actually just mentioning the headlines and the EDL one. And which one else? Uh, the Camden. Camden case. That one maybe I will I will stop and well. just read a, a paragraph from their story instead, um, so people know why we've nominated them. So uh, on the on the topic uh, that we were we were on again Syria related, Barack Obama again. This is an article in the Guardian. It says Barack Obama urges United Nations to set up a global ban on fighters. Okay, resolution thought to be widely supported would impose travel bans on fighters intent on joining overseas wars, like the ones that the uh, British and the American uh, Jews went to join in Israel with the uh, Israeli armed forces. I'm guessing he's referring to those types of fighters. Or did he forget to add the word on Muslim fighters, ban on Muslim fighters? I think that would be a more accurate uh, description. And uh, surprise, surprise, the United Nations is very happy to perhaps um, pass a vote on that one. Moving quickly on from that, Vice News. Um, they've said that they've got an exclusive look inside the FBI's files on the U.S. citizen who edited Al-Qaeda's official magazine. And there's some statements here by some lawyers that they refer to here. The, a man by the name of Samir Khan, this brother, he was uh, alongside Anwar al-Awlaki, by the way. I- Imam Anwar and Samir Khan, they were both killed by a rocket strike, bombed, basically, by the American government. I didn't say ISIS. Yes, they were bombed by the American government. And they were Briti- uh, sorry, American citizens. Uh, and uh, they were this re- referred to here as extrajudicial killing and the reason why this story has come up again with the vice news it was a freedom of information kind of request and they've managed to find out from the fbi files that samir khan the man that they killed with a rocket strike um the, the one who they bombed to death this samir khan actually only wrote stuff on blogs 
And he didn't, they, they had no evidence. Well, from the Freedom of Information uh, report, there's no evidence that he was being investigated for an active plot to do any kind of uh, terrorism in uh, the United States of America. He was essentially killed for writing stuff on the internet. End of story for that one. That's exactly how the Americans roll. It's the Wild Wild West. We want to kill you. We just go all guns blazing. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're American now, mate. You're, you're brown. You ain't American. Don't need no judge. Don't need no court. We just kill you. We judge dread. We judge jury and executioner. That's exactly what's happened. In Austria. Is it Austria? Austria is pushing for a standardized version of the Quran. Basically, mm. that headline is all I'm going to read. Um, I think it's self-explanatory. Some European countries are looking for uh, a uh, government-approved, government-edited, government-stamped, standardized version of the Quran because, you see, the Quran is full of uh, you know good stuff that they just simply can't tolerate. Um, so they're going to work towards that. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that we are the ones who revealed this book, this Quran, and we indeed are the ones who will protect it and preserve it. So we think this is going to be another failed attempt by the non-Muslims uh, who hate Islam, not all non-Muslims, to try and change the religion. That There have been many efforts before. Um, there were some excellent statements actually coming from Cage, okay, uh, formerly Cage prisoners. We can't read all of them. Some superb statements there. Um, go to their website, okay? It's uh, www.cageuk. Dot org. That's www.cageuk.org. I think Brother Dilly's mentioned a few of the points that, that Cage also mentioned in this statement. Um, uh, so, you know, by all means, go check out their website. Moving quickly on to the next article. Here's the EDL one. This is the one. So, prolific. this is from edlnews.co.uk. Go check out their website for all up-to-date stuff related EDO, all things related to EDO. It says here, prolific English Defence League paedophile Archie Sleman arrested. Okay. Um, one of the English Defence League's most prolific paedophiles, Archie, his, uh, his back behind bars again after six months on the run. Okay. Again, do I want to read the gory details? I mean, it's just horrendous and it's something it's just distasteful i can't even anyway it says june last year edo news revealed that archie who also goes by the name of mark okay um he kidnapped and raped a 10 year old girl astaghfirullah in a caravan and also had convictions for armed robbery against home a homeless man and a carriage i mean why would you why would you do an armed robbery against a homeless man <laughs> Why are you going to rob this guy? Stuff, man? I shouldn't be laughing. It's just, I mean, the, the level of IQ called, on, of is, the EDL. This is what you call your Islamic ray guns, right? That's it, right. It, 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 this, yeah. this is a typical case of, you know, Sharon's uh, people, law. Um, hypocrisy, you know, complaining about Muslimic ray guns and Sharon's law. And here they are in, in, in their own ranks. They've got people who are raping 10-year-old girls. Astaghfirullah. And it's just disgusting. Do I need to go one? No, no let's move on from that. So there's the EDO, the real face of EDO, what they get up to in their spare time. And um, they absolutely have got no right to be talking about, you know, so-called Pakistani, uh, uh, Asian and Muslimic ray guns. That, that's for sure. All right. Next story. And this is quite an important story, actually. Uh, that's the reason why, by the way, sorry, the EDL guy is, uh, Archie, is actually uh, put on the list uh, for Django of this week. So... Uh, if you agree, go tweet Django of the Week, Archie, okay, um, so, or, or, or EDL, and we'll get you know, we'll get the we'll get the uh, message. So, this story is in the BBC uh, website. It says here that Islamic, uh, well, let's let's be clear, ISIS and the Rotherham abuse uh, case is fueling the far right. So this ISIS group and the Rotherham abuse scandal are fueling a far-right backlash in the UK. One of the Home Office's most senior advisors on right-wing extremism, that's right, non-Muslim extremism, has said. The anonymous member of staff or worker claims that the government has overlooked the problem amid its focus on tackling only jihadists. The Home Office says it is working to prevent all forms of extremism. However, we know that the right-wing extremists are allowed to run rampage. Anyway, it says here, but the, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue claims the government must engage more with the far-right angle of extremism. So we don't need to go into a lot of details. We know what's happening. The article's made it clear. 
that the case of Rotherham is being used and talked about and bounced about day in, day out in the media. Same with the case of ISIS. And this is actually festering, um, uh, you know, uh, what, what should I say? It's, in, it's inciting a lot of those people who, you know, hail from the far right with those extremist tendencies. They are they feel, they feel like they want to take it out on Muslims living in the UK. And that's really the reason why you know, people here in the UK are demanding that Muslims have to apologize, Muslim, Muslims have to um, uh, you know, take responsibility for the actions of groups that are non-related to the UK Muslims, uh, such as ISIS. So again, that's the BBC article coming from a very uh, high place, uh, close to the government, where they're saying that the far right extremism is actually on the rise because of the uh, because of the case of Rotherham and other other um, things like ISIS. There's another story here. Queensland's this is in Australia. A Muslim woman has been targeted, okay, amid terrorism hysteria. This is in the Courier Mail. So this is not just happening in the UK. We can see non-Muslims across the globe are getting very very anti-Islamic. And f- starting to act on their Islamophobia. All these years, the kind of hate that they had of these so-called immigrants, these these um, Muslims, they're beginning to act on their rage and their Islamophobia. And it is the women mm. who are suffering, who That's are being attacked. Because they're, apparent. they're cowards. They're cowards. They're cowards. Number one and number two is obviously they're more app- they're more apparent in terms of their clothing makes them stand out specifically. But the key thing is that they're cowards. They wouldn't. They don't like going up to men and having a little. Uh, tussle with them they rather just abuse those who are weaker because uh, they just get knocked the lights out like the uh, guy in the Turkish uh, Dona Kebab sh- shop the other day <coughs> not that we recommend uh, anybody go and do that so um, this is the final story which is the Camden uh, school management they've decided to ban uh, a Muslim teenager a Muslim woman Muslim sister okay from taking her A-levels because she wears the niqab. Now, whatever happened to the right to education? What has happened to um, you know everybody being equal? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Freedom hang on religion. a minute. Does this school not sound like the Taliban now? You know uh, the whole story we had before. Yeah, but all oh, the, ta- the, 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 the you know you know the Taliban are preventing girls from going to school and being education. Here we have a female. A UK British in citizen in London the being prevented city. from education. So, from what's the difference? You know, and on top of that, I did read this article, read the article about the, the Camden School, which is there is no uniform policy. The school has not got a uniform policy. So therefore, on what grounds are they saying that you can't wear the niqab? They're saying it's to do with, uh, I can't remember, some, they gave some very, very, you know, this rubbish excuse. In a statement, the school has said, we have an appearance policy and the students at the school may wear what they wish, subject to any requirement in the interest of teaching and learning health and safety. Inappropriate dress, which offends public decency or which does not allow teacher student interactions, will be challenged. There you go. That's their that's their justification. Yeah. It's inappropriate dress. So you can go in, this, in go to do your A levels if probably, you're wearing you can uh, probably go to school. Uh, I possibly you probably can cut. go there naked and probably and they'll probably be fine with about that. But you know, yeah. if, if you're covered, oh, hang on a minute, there's, there's a problem. Same old argument, same old thing. They're trying to use it on all Basically security it's issues. Racism, racism, and um, sexism as well. I'm gonna throw that one in there. So they don't like for women to, um, you know, be empowered enough to make their own decisions as to what they want to wear. Um, women have the right to choose what they like to do as long as it's not illegal. They can, they should Basically, be able to. Women have the to right have to choose. To education. Their whole philosophy here is women have a right to choose to what they wear as long as it pleases men. You know, this is this is their philosophy exactly. basically. It's that's, simple as that. Exactly you have the right to choose as long as it pleases men. If it doesn't, hang on a minute, that right's going to get taken away from you. You know. Brilliantly said, brother Khabbab. Moving on. That is the reason why we've nominated the Camden School Management for Django of the Week. Hashtag Django of the Week. Okay. We also know because of the Rotherham uh, story, um, uh, the Masjid in the town centre of Rotherham has actually been burgled and vandalised and many copies of the Qur'an strewn all over the place inside uh, the the masjid, the mosque and the mosque has had its money, you know, the charity box and everything that has been, uh, you know, stolen from there but primarily I, I see the mosque management complaining here that, you know, they stole the money, that's one thing however, they disrespected, um, you know, our you know sacred text they threw it around all over the place it wasn't that they were just here for the money they seemed to be motivated by other reasons okay um so this is really what's happening and um uh, this is uh, we know that edl the the what's it the safe haven for peter faust um uh, seems to be the 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 group going to rotherham to demonstrate against pedophilia 
what a what a double what a, irony what, 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 <laughs> maybe Archie was there um, you know <laughs> demonstrating against pedophilia um, or maybe he was um, uh, robbing a homeless man with a gun I'm or maybe sure. he was in Rotherham to find out how to better skill himself maybe, in his crimes that's right maybe he was there out to do some networking who knows who knows anyway that's why um, Archie's on the short list so is the Camden School last story and this is the final story brothers this is the final story he and promises. I didn't put that in there it's he promise. promises this is my promise um, this is a interesting story because it says here that researchers claim that mobile data can predict future crimes. So um, this is happening in, in London. Scientists in London are claiming that mobile phone data can predict future crime hotspots with 70% accuracy. The findings provide evidence that aggregated and anonymized data collected by a carrier's mobile infrastructure can contain relevant information to describe a geographical area in order to predict its crime level. Okay, I'm going to go right to the bottom of the article, which simply says here, the methods found in this study really aren't that much different from those found in the Hollywood movie called The Minority Report. Therefore, expect Tom Cruise to come and grab you in the middle of the night if you plan on committing a crime, but you haven't yet committed it, basically. That's it. That's the end of the story. Can you believe that? They're using mobile phone data to predict if you're going to commit a crime, and before you've even committed any crime or ever committed a crime, well, obviously based this on their prediction, this, will, this has, has already charged. rolled out to the Muslims. As we know, pre-crime is already in effect. That's the right. pre-cons are already uh, giving their, you know, uh, what you call it? He um, would have. You know, He's predisposed to a terrorist it's, it's, it's already happened where these people who are now being in, put in prison... If we hadn't for, put in bars today, for, he would have bombed us. For thought crime. As simple so. as that. They've not done an actual crime. Rather, they hold an ideology or an understanding or, or an opinion. You know, or opinion. And that's it. You know, we've seen it many times. And this is what you're going into... I remember the case of a sister who wrote poems on the back of a receipt, you know, nicknamed the lyrical terrorist, you know. She was put in bar, you know, behind put bars. behind bars just for writing poetry. Barakallahu feek. I think that is the end of my list of articles. We That's did have the I think uh, we should have more guests on the show next time so we can cut down on uh, Brother Ahmed's articles. I'm going to be, uh, I am the only guest on this show, okay, <laughs> and also the host of this show. So I get to read whatever articles. Well, like. yeah, the, well, the and as you have seen, your title has been removed after the He's already out of the equation. You are just next in line. But uh, unfortunately, okay. I am still the so last listen, bastion. There's been two guns. <laughs> this bastion is not going to go down without a fight. You see. Unfortunately, you know, we have to get rid of all of these Django's. Good luck, Django Jonathan. <laughs> so good luck, Django Jonathan. Ain't going to be letting any of that happen, inshallah. So really, want to thank all our listeners, especially our two guests that came uh, on on air with us uh, earlier on in the show. Um, we've had a lot to talk about. If you've got f- you know f- uh, comments and thoughts. Tweet at us, okay? Leave us a text message on 0747080248. We will try to read that to you next week, inshallah. And go vote for Django of the week, okay? I think it's time to decide because we already got a couple of votes, okay, coming in. And I've got my view on this. I, I'm, I'm beginning to feel uh, Archie on the, the, the split. I know you want, um, uh, no, uh, one of the persons, you haven't decided yet who you want. Uh, I haven't, I haven't cast my vote yet. Uh, I think Archie is the guy who's got to go for it. I mean, he, the man actually um, did an armed robbery against a homeless person. <laughs> You're right. I think that, I feel that part just swayed me. Out. I think you can't, I mean, you can't get. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get more of a Django <laughs> than that. <laughs> you, that's like Bevanry Django. <laughs> <laughs> give me your money. Give me your gold. Give me your. Give me your car. Like, mate, I'm homeless. Can't you see? You know, I got nothing. <laughs> give me your cardboard box. <laughs> Oh, I think I, I think it's got to be decided. It's just it's just too silly. It's just ridiculous. So, uh, I think we're going to go. Archie. Thank you to our voters who d- wanted. Um, uh, I think who, who, somebody wanted um, Obama, Obama and Cameron. Somebody and wanted Cameron. Um, uh, but I think that would be kind of following our usual kind of uh, line of voting from previous weeks. This week. As you know, this is the Security Council. We vetoed your vote t- tonight. But next week, I think I'll be um, a little bit more forgiving and let you brothers and sisters decide who will be Django of the Week. This week, it's over to, it's, it's gone, to, gone to Archie. So without further delay, join us next week, inshallah, Tuesday, 10 p.m. Hopefully, we'll have an equally hot 
line up for you. And before I close, I have to do this favor from our Bangla brothers on Sunday. They did ask me when they gave our show a plug because they mentioned uh, to their listeners that they should listen, tune in Tuesdays to listen to Security Council. And I said I would do the same on our show. So before I close, I want to say tune in on Sundays. Those of us who can speak and understand Bangla, tune in on Sundays is at 8 p.m. Um, with uh, br- another brother who's also con- who's also known as Ahmed, uh, brother um, uh, Ishaq, I think is also there. They will be covering some equally hot topics, uh, but they were doing it in the Bangla language. So every Sunday, 8 p.m., listen to the Bangla Obimot program. That's all from us from the Security Council. See you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. In a world overrun by neocon warmongers and with the mass media in the pockets of the cabal elite, there remains one bastion of truth amidst the confusion. One beacon of light shining through the murky fog of spin and Islamophobic propaganda. That's right. It's the MP Radio Security Council, the final frontier in the fight for freedom and fairness. I give you the Security Council. <laughs>